Thank you, Carlos. So yes, we should start recording. No, um, <laughs> so as I was saying, we're a uh, second session, last session on this book, um, uh, Platonic Production by uh, Stanley Rosen, which we're kind of going to in part because he's, it's kind of a, um, it's a reaction to, Pla uh, to Heidegger's take on Plato's understanding of truth, right? Um, which we ran into a little bit in our previous reading uh, toward the end of uh, Basic Problems of Phenomenology. And we We'll get more of than what was uh, planned to be our next reading, which is actually Heidegger on the essence of truth. Um, I want to start by saying a little bit about um, things for next time. Um, we can talk a bit more about this at the end, but the plan is to read in, in, in this book um, about the first 75 pages. That's uh, part one, section one, the four stages of the occurrence of truth, which is basically Heidegger going through the allegory of the cave with his own reading of it. Um, There'll be a, the remainder of part one in this is another 40 odd pages, which we'll do as a, se as a separate thing. Mm -hmm. I want to focus on just those 75 for, for next time. We can talk uh, also about um, when people want to do it. I think the, um, I would like to do it on the 26th of June, because if we don't do it then, I'm gonna have to go longer because the um, Sunday after that, I'm uh, on vacation and be away for two Sundays. So mm -hmm. uh, if three weeks is enough uh, for people, if I know we gave some notice for people to get the book, if three weeks enough for people to get the book and read 75 pages of the Heidegger stuff that we can pencil in that as the, the next session for the 26th of June. 25? Just to clarify, you said the 25th of June, 25? I'm just trying to figure this out. 26th yes. 26 Six. of June. Six. 26. Okay. Just, yes. just clarifying, I'm filling in 20, the calendar 20, page. Already. Yep, 26th of June, Sunday the 26th of June, 1 p.m. And the right. reading is the first 75 pages of this. Um, which should be the, the, the four stages of the occurrence of truth. Page H might be different in your edition, but you could use right. a different one. All right, um, those preliminaries out of the way. Uh, we're gonna do the, our usual round robin. People, a um, little bit of intro. Have you, um, uh, did, were you able to do the reading? Um, had you read any of this uh, Rosen stuff before or the uh, other texts he's talking about, uh, the public, et cetera, uh, any of the Heidegger stuff that's being talked about here? Um, and. Uh, uh, first, first reactions as well. Um, uh, welcome, Chuck. Um, so, Joe, do you want to start us off? I know you said you, did, you were so busy, you didn't do a lot of the readings. So maybe you'll be quick. I, I was totally submerged and, and was unable to do the readings at all this time, but I, I'm eager to listen to the discussion. Okay, simple enough. And had, had you, have you, I mean, you were on a couple of the sessions we read other things that Rosen before. Is that right? We read, we read Rosen before, uh, before yeah. we were Zooming in meetings. Uh, I was very impressed with uh, the contributions he made to the earlier okay. uh, books that we discussed. Uh, so I was pleased, and but I, I appreciate the, this lecture at the University of Paris. He's actually trying to uh, find ways in which Heidegger doesn't quite understand as much as Heidegger would have wished Heidegger did understand about Plato and uh, these ideas. And it's nice to see the contrast between another scholar, uh, you know, bringing out what's one may be mistaken about Plato. Sure, I mean, I, I, there's two things, at least two things going on, but I mean, from his own um, framing of it, he is disagreeing with some of Heidegger's takes on Plato. Um, he also, however, is learning quite a bit from Heidegger in terms of how he reads Plato. Um, and and uh, he's even by the end of it, you know, kind of revising the Platonism he, he believes himself of, you know, well, I don't know if I can keep that part uh, after this sort of stuff. So it, it's a, um, a little more nuanced by the end of it than that, but certainly early on, he's, he's talking about ways which he thinks that um, sort of as a, almost as a textual matter, um, he doesn't think Heidegger gets Plato right. But um, we'll talk more about what the, um, yeah, we'll talk more about that whole overall assessment. And there's, there's a third man in the room besides the Plato and the, uh, well, at least a third, um, Nietzsche, I mean, um, as well as maybe Aristotle, but um, okay. Uh, Craig, reading and, yeah, I was able to get through the reading. Uh, I have to say, uh, chapter four was a struggle, just trying to figure out what the hell he's talking about. Um, so I think uh, maybe uh, another run through by Heidegger when we get to it on the 26th might be a help. But, uh, but I was really trying to figure out what his distinctions were that he was trying to make. And, uh, and especially when it came to uh, um, I think one of the phrases that really hung me up was a well-structured city, whatever the hell that is. Um, 
<laughs> and uh, so, so I had troubles with that. I got better. Uh, the last two essays got better. And uh, mm -hmm. I thought the final essay had a lot of good points uh, relating to things about uh, uh, stuff that, uh, that, uh, that he was revising on his views on, on Plato and, uh, and putting in some more modern understandings of, uh, of the world around us and a more modern understanding of it. And that, that helped, uh, at least from my perspective, I still have a little bit of trouble with, uh, with the uh, cosmology of, of the era of the cave compared to modern cosmology and modern understandings <clears throat> Except, <clears throat> excuse me, concepts like, uh, like um, uh, we have in quantum mechanics now where the definiteness of a thing is it's a little bit in question. So, so that, that helped to see a little bit more what he was trying to revise there. And, uh, and so I felt like I liked chapter six. I didn't like chapter four. Chapter five <laughs> was kind of okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, and was it in, in four, was it just the fact that he seemed to be going back and forth on the things he was talking about? Or was it the, the uh, interpreting the cave parts that seemed confused or was it the other things he was bringing in that interpretation? Uh, yes. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I, I felt like he was assuming a level of familiarity with the story of the cave, the uh, allegory of the cave that I, I didn't have because sure. uh, it's been you know 50 plus years. <laughs> since uh, since I, I dealt with it so i'm a little bit concerned about you know trying to pick up and i think it's going to take another read i may have to go back and actually read it in plato uh and uh and I to, to 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 get to a better understanding of what each of them is trying to get at but again the uh the reinterpretation for modern times is is something that was kind of sitting at the back of my mind uh, uh during the whole thing too gotcha okay um, one of the things I notice in in is that there's various things he says in four, uh, describing sort of his takeaways or his uh, reads of the cave, that reminded me very much of the stuff we saw in the uh, uh, Hans Jonas Gnosticism stuff, right? Um, right. The the it's it's almost as though um, uh, Jonas's description of, of Gnosticism could have been taken from this interpretation of the cave. <laughs> um, yeah. But uh, we, we might, might, might come back to that. Um, OK, so I, uh, my screens are jumping around as, as uh, new people come in. But uh, Pete, do you want to take, uh, try to go next? Pete saw me. So the, 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 this is my first time reading this. Uh, I, I did manage to re read the three chapters. Uh, my overall impression was that it's uh, Rosen uh, articulating his interpretation of Plato and uh, the theory of the forms uh, rather than engaging closely with uh, Heidegger's interpretation. And I, I think that's par for the course because Heidegger, when you read his text on Kant or Hegel, you're not getting Kant or Hegel. <laughs> you're getting Heidegger. You know? right. So that, that's you know situation normal for uh, Rosen to talk about uh, his interpretation of Plato. Uh, and uh, you know, I, you know the, the, there it is. Uh, there, uh, it, it seems. Uh, in, in general, to follow the in standard interpretation I got over the years, uh, although he goes into a lot of more detail and uh, connects it with other platonic dialogues and, uh, and other notions uh, from Plato, uh, rather than sticking uh, ju just to this part of the Republic. Uh, one comment to uh, sort of orient myself on what in Heidegger uh, Rosen's reacting against, I went back and read uh, Heidegger's lecture, Plato's Doctrine of Truth, 
<clears throat> from 3132, it's in the Pathmarks hey, collection of essays. Yep, what was that? Sorry, sorry. That, was, I'm that was just Jim to... talking to someone in his room. <laughs> no, <ahead>. okay. <laughs> uh, and that one, it, it starts off with five pages from the Republic and then uh, goes through the four stages, uh, kind of like what <laughs> Rosen's following. So I, I think that's kind of like the key text uh, that Rosen's reacting against. And then in a few places, he mentions the 1933 lectures you want to yep. uh, follow. But I think this is the key one. Uh, and reading it, I, I guess I, I don't see the uh, production is such a big deal to uh, Heidegger as uh, Rosen seems to imply <clears throat> that it's a metaphysics of production that Heidegger reads into Plato. And that's part of what Rosen's reacting against. Uh, and on the other hand, I, I see Heidegger's interpretation of the cave pretty much following, first he explains the standard interpretation. That, that seems to be uh, fairly normal. And then when Heidegger, Heidegger goes off on what he considers his, the points he wants to make about uh, how this inaugura inaugurates Western metaphysics and so forth. Uh, and how, how uh, Heidegger interprets uh, metaphysics differently and so forth. That's the parts I found Rosen's not engaging with. Uh, he's providing his interpretation, which is all well and good, uh, but I was hoping for more based on the premise of the uh, essay which is a response to uh, Heidegger. Uh, I, I was a little disappointed that there wasn't more of that directly. Heidegger says this, and I disagree because X, Y, Z. So that, that's my impression. Okay, yeah. I mean, I think it's uh, certainly he refers to that essay and that's definitely one of the three places he's probably thinking of the most, but there's at least two others. I mean, the the, the uh, the book that we're going to read next is one of them because that el elaborates the four, the four stages um, quite a bit more. And it's prefaced with this um, truth is correctness shift um, uh, that is half, I would say, of the of the stuff that uh, is bothering mm -hmm. Rosen, so to speak. Um, and the other places actually often the in the um, in the books on Nietzsche, the, the Heidegger and Nietzsche, um, where some of this is tied into um, uh, not only um, some of the background to um, Nietzsche's own views on uh, production, uh, on production as metaphysics, so to speak, but metaphysics in generally, and, and the whole um, metaphysical history you get in sort of the later parts of the Nietzsche, of the Nietzsche books. So um, uh, I don't think that Rosen is reacting only to one link in that chain. He's, he's reacting to the arc Right, um, and the, the arc is going from um, Plato initiating truth is correctness <laughs> to um, uh, Western metaphysics culminating in Nietzschean productionist metaphysics, and it's a little bit like saying, uh, um, uh, so the words that Rosen is perhaps unjustly, but perhaps justly putting in in into Heidegger's mouth is that um, Western metaphysics leads to uh, Nietzschean productionist metaphysics nihilism, right, and techne. And it all started with that bang Plato. So uh, it's the Plato in him that, 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 that made him uh, do it, something like that. Uh, that's, I'm, I'm grossly uh, oversimplifying, but the, the, the productionist metaphysics is, is there at the end and it's patent at the end of the metaphysics arc that Heidegger paints. And the question is then, <laughs> is it there in the whole tissue? And um, Rosen uh, thinks that Heidegger is claiming that it is, and that 
this is sort of a point of its origin, and especially of the um, that the turn to truth is correctness is part of the falling away from um, the event of Dasein or something like that, the event of, of the appearing um, in earlier Greek thinking. And in a way, this is, Rosen is reading this in, as in a way um, uh, Heidegger's update on Nietzsche's birth of tragedy, right? Nietzsche's birth of tragedy, Socrates is responsible for initiating, ra ra killing Greek tragedy by initiating uh, rationalism by having all these rationalist objections to the tragic worldview that turned Euripides into a, uh, 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 a melodramatist in, instead of a, a tragedian or something like that. Um, but the, you, you, can, you can think of this as uh, an updating of that story or Rosen sees Heidegger as having updated that story the blame is now not on Socrates for rationalism, but on Plato for inventing metaphysics. And the place where he invents metaphysics is when he changes the doctrine of truth. So that, that's the sort of um, uh, capsule or cartoon version of what I see R Rosen reacting to. Now, you're, it's fair to say that doesn't mean he's down in each uh, chain of Heidegger's argument. Um, sorry, react yeah, we, we can talk about the different parts of the arc in detail later. Well, one other thing to add to first impressions is I also got the impression that Rosen was reacting against analytical philosophers in part. And that's kind of where he was sympathetic to Heidegger's arguments. Yes, he is. He, he's definitely doing that. And he's reacting to analytical. Yes. And he, he's also seeing some of that in both uh, Heidegger and Nietzsche. Um, but uh, Maybe even more in, he in Heidegger that there's there's an element of uh, Heidegger's uh, critique of truth as correctness, which is reaction to the logical positivists right around him, not to Plato. Um, but uh, um, there are things about the logical positivists right around him that remind him of or look like the uh, Plato of the sophist, something like that. Um, uh, so, and the truth of correctness is kind of point of commonality of them. All good stuff. Uh, we'll try to get to those. Um, some of those we get to the uh, deeper into it. Um, is it uh, Ilyana? Want to go next? Welcome, by the way. Ilana. Ilana, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's my first time. I just uh, saw it on Meetup and um, wanted to check it out. So I have not done any reading. Okay. And um, I'm not, not probably as well versed in. A lot of the philosophy is a lot of people here, but I'm interested and I'm interested in um, ancient philosophers and uh, how they all ancient Greece and Buddhism and Hinduism and quantum physics and all that stuff kind of intertwine. Okay. So I'm interested to see what you talk about. Um, I'm new to Zoom, so I'm not quite sure how I'll last. And I probably won't stay for the whole three hours. Does it usually last three hours? Or four. Three or four, okay. usually, yeah. Yeah. Um, I schedule it for that, but uh, usually it actually goes three, three and a half to four. Um, but uh, there's people usually have a lot to say. <laughs> um, but uh, we'll see. I mean, sometimes it's only two. But you're certainly welcome to stay the whole time, and, and questions are always good. Um, uh, we're going to keep going around the table. And after we get everybody's first impressions, we'll you know start going through bits of the uh, the text we were reading itself and the issues it's raised in it and and also answer people's questions about it. Um, but OK, uh, Carlos, you want to go next? Sure. Yeah, I did read the whole uh, assignment. Um, never read Rosen before. And uh, this was to me an education in uh, discerning the differences between Aristotle, Plato and Socrates, um, because I don't have the background in philosophy. However, readings, readings like this do provide some uh, input. There is one aspect of it that was really um, it caught my attention. This dichotomy between noetic intuition and discursive thinking, mm -hmm. that was pretty interesting because, uh, but one of the things that I was thinking about is you can have all the noetic intuition you want, but you can't communicate unless you have you engage in discursive um, discursive activities. Um, he does, a, he plays with it a little bit, but that that is a subject that is, uh, to me, is truly fascinating. Uh, 
it makes you wonder if uh, if the, the the shift from noetic intuition to discursive the need for discursive thinking is the biblical fall. <laughs> I mean, it, it's crazy, but uh, I'm not a religious person. But I'm wondering um, to what extent uh, this dichotomy plays a big deal in in, uh, in human in human existence. Um, and that was, and again, the, the rest of it was just very educational to me. Okay. Um, I mean, th there's there's certainly a commonality in um, wrote. This is one of the places where um, Rosen kind of agrees with the fundamental point of Heidegger about the fact that there's something like a um, an intellectual intuition step in cognitive understanding that comes before the. Uh, verbal interpretation as communication to others. We saw this when we were back in the basic problems book. Um, uh, we were talking about um, uh, apophantic uh, discourse is you know, trying to uh, uh, convey what is to someone. And the way that it does that is um, it first has a view, uh, it has a, its own understanding of the being of something, the meaning of something. And it tries to let the other person come to uh, experience or see that themselves, right? So that the the purpose of the descriptive language is not is is to bring the other person before the being to which he can have his own experience of it, um, and that's different from uh, the only thing he has to be brought before is the words. The words are to contain the whole thought. Um, so uh, it's a point of agreement between um, Heidegger and Rosen and Rosen's reading of Plato that all of them see that as being sort of part of the nature of um, intellectual understanding, philosophical understanding of something, um, th that there's a, a, a direct seeing of the, uh, of the neurotic reality, something like that. Um, and the funny thing here is seeing is always being used here in a, in a metaphorical sense. They don't mean actual, they don't mean actual seeing. Um, Perception, perceived. Well, but the point is that when we're talking about the noetic, we're talking about something which is, um, not simply the perceptual, right? It's intellectual yeah, perception, right? It's, it, doesn't, it's, it doesn't come through the senses necessarily. Yeah. So I mean, when you're when you're when you're thinking about a mathematical truth, right? You may be using imagination to help prompt it, but the but the mathematical truths you're thinking about, right, are not in the realm of the perceptibles, right? Yeah. In, that, in, in in the part in the part of Plato immediately before the cave, right? It's the it's the uh, the story of the divided line, which divides things up according to, you know, what realm of experience they're in. And 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 uh, the passion perceptibles, right, are are, are one into that spectrum, and then on the whole noetic uh, end end of that of the divided line is outside of the perceptibles. It's the purely intellectual. It's the the, the place where something like truth happens. Um, Jason, would you say? Uh, sorry for interrupting. I just uh, before I forget, would you say that intuition then is a superset of uh, perception? It's a, an abstraction of perception. Well. Different philosophers here have different doctrines on that. In Aristotle, it is he is kind of does kind of conflate it with the common sense. He he gives the notion of <clears throat> common sense, which isn't one of the five senses, is a place where the um, uh, the information from all the senses has to be brought together and synthesized, right? And um, uh, Plato in Theaetetus, which is going to be talked about also in in, in Heidegger uh, Heidegger's book on this. Um, Brings up and argues that you can tell that there that there that the seat of uh, intellectual thought whatever is not in the senses because it's not as localized as the senses right the eyes and the ears are not in the same place they have to be brought together in one place there has to be a one that brings them together um, you get a similar notion in Kant with the notion of the synthetic unity of apperception right these are all talking about the same <laughs> notion of there being something like a um, a noetic synthetic place where thoughts come together, which isn't simply the senses. And the senses are only actually only providing information or, or tool-like things used by that. Um, so in, in Aristotle, that's the common sense. In Kant, that's the synthetic unity of apperception and the transcendental ego is the thing which does it. Um, in Plato, it's just, uh, it's just mind or uh, noetic soul. Um, but all of that is even true of information about purely perceptibles. 
the extra thing about noetic intuition is that it's not just bringing together um, sense intuitions uh, in a place which isn't just one of the senses. It's also thinking about something which isn't itself perceptible. It isn't itself a, a purely a, simply a sensible. It's thinking about something more abstract than that, if you like. It's thinking about something more mathematical than that, if you like. And um, to Plato, the claim is that um, the noetic realm has more exactness to it for that reason. Now, this is also why it winds up getting equated with the linguistic. It gets equated with the with the logical, and and especially in Aristotle, right? The, the logic machinery becomes more and more important for understanding what the noetic what realm is like. Like the noetic realm is morphing into the logical realm. This is what um, Rosen is alluding to when he says thinking is being replaced by syntax, right? The, yeah. the um, and logical syntax. So the, the logical syntax of a mathematical log logician is meant to be something like the machinery of how noetic thinking is uh, normatively supposed to work. Um, not that how it does work, but how it is normally supposed to work when you're thinking clearly, something like that. But the thinking clearly is clear because it's truth preserving. That's what, that, that's what makes it rigorously or good thinking. That's sort of on the syntax into the spectrum, right? But, but, but going in, the mere fact that you're uh, thinking about things that way, um, talking about things like that, means you're not simply talking about um, perceptible objects. You're not just talking about you know, uh, uh, trees and fences. You're talking about uh, triangles and two as well, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, OK, so, uh, and so the noetic intuition that Heidegger, Plato, Rosen all agree that there's something like this noetic step in understanding and that it's not um, fully communicable, right? People have to independently see the things and the language can only be used to help point to it, bring them to it, bring out an aspect of it. They have to themselves um, have the experience of the direct perception of, 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 the, of the true things. Think about how one mathematician communicates to another through a through, through you know writing a proof about something, right? They have to use a, a, a discursive language. They have to use you know, symbols and so forth. But they're trying to, especially in the geometrical sort of uh, things, they're trying to bring the other mathematician to be able to see the same idea, right? And mm -hmm. it's not simply a matter of uh, you can write the math paper so clearly that uh, a computer can read it on the other end. You actually need a mathematician on the other end, and a pretty good one. Or you won't even know what you're talking about. Right? <clears throat> to, 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 to the to, to a um, someone who isn't a good mathematician trying to read a hard math paper, it will be gibberish. Um, why? Because the syntax is not so clear that, that it does the thinking for you, right? The individual steps are hard. The individual steps require you to bring plenty of if I can put this way, imaginative power and ability to, you know, conceive the objects being discussed to the table yourself. Okay, so that's the kind of thing they're getting at here, mm -hmm. they're thinking about here, and why? Because <clears throat> they're, 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 the question is truth, right? They're, they're trying to wrestle with uh, what truth is like, where truth happens, um, and this is a paradigm example of it, and it's an, an example of it um, that shows how far it is from just the objects of sense, right? There's a, there's a tradition of some of the um, <clears throat> earlier Greek thinkers um, that wants to reduce truth to perception. That's one of the theses that gets discussed in, um, mm -hmm. in the uh, uh, in Theotetus, right? Um, mm -hmm. but, it's, but it's not simply perception. So what are all the ways in which it's not simply perception? And, and this is you know, the kind of stuff they're bringing out there. So, uh, but as, as for all of that in language, right? They, there, there's a, a continual attempt because there's elements of that noetic intuition which are not fully communicable to improve the clarity of the communication to you know, refine the language so that it can convey more of it and the independent thinking has to do less and the language can do more, right? So the, the language becomes more exact, more elaborate, um, uh, finer, becomes mathematical logic, if you like. Um, but uh, 
there are fewer and fewer things you can say that way, unfortunately. Um, so it's, but anyway, the, 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 the flip side of this, the linguistic philosophy take on this is that um, this whole intuitionist notion is just trying to describe something which the people uh, who think that way uh, don't understand and that actually they're thinking linguistically, but they're just not conscious of the linguistic terms in which they're thinking. And they're, the, they are thinking linguistic, linguistically, their language is structuring their thoughts, the things they can think are linguistic, they are um, uh, uh, word machines, right? And uh, programmed by language, right? And uh, that's a view that all the people in this book are kind of disagreeing with, but know that it's out there on the other side. On, on the other side, there are people that say, all this uh, noetic intuition stuff is guff. The reality is just the syntax. The reality is just the language and people's thoughts are structured by their language. Mm -hmm. um, that's sort of the other, other end of the spectrum. Joe, we had a question. So the same thing is like defining your opposition out of existence because they really just say the same thing you do, but they don't know it. <laughs> um, well, uh, it is certainly, it is certainly trying. Uh, yes, they, they are. Um, each of them has ways of explaining the phenomena that the other person sees. Right. But the, the, the intuitionist thinks that the person who is reducing all thought to language is not really thinking is not fully thinking or at least doesn't want to admit that he's fully thinking, um, even if they would, I can see that he is. And the linguistic uh, uh, philosopher will say that the intuitionist is confused and just unaware of uh, how much his, his thought is structured by language, right? Um, but this, this practice of what uh, Rosen calls uh, philosophers psychoanalyzing each other, right, is, is uh, <laughs> it's normal, like as, as, as Pete, as Pete says, right? <laughs> um, it reminds me Carlos. of what the Marxists do when they define you out of existence. <laughs> well, I think it's more common than that. But Carlos, do you is there such is there much of a difference between this noetic intuition concept and the concept of Kant's uh, what is it, the unity of the synthetic, synthetic unity, unity of, 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 of apperception? Yeah. So, um, I mean, synthetic, synthetic unity of apperception is meant to be the 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 place where all of the intuitions come together. Intuitions is a technical term for Kant. Um, intuitions means um, uh, it's 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 not just the senses. It's the it's the st stage or arena on which, into which the senses project, right? Yeah. So um, so, uh, but and that and that includes the um, from the Kantian point of view. Some of the structure of that, like our notions of space and time, are already there. We don't have to experience them from the external world. We bring them with us, so to speak. They're part of the machinery of how we think. We've projected them onto experiences. We've structured experiences with them. But the the synthetic unity uh, of our perception idea is 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 Kant's replacement for the um, Aristotelian common sense that that puts together information from. All the, all the sources of intuition. Um, but the Kant's claims about it though are very formal, right? He, for him, it's a, it's a bare, I think, right? Uh, the, it, all, mm -hmm. the, only thing, the only thing we know about it is, it is that it is some I that thinks, right? It is the, the actor in our thoughts that is the I think that puts these things together. Um, and he claims, just like he claims about the thing in itself and other, in other areas, that we can know uh, very little about it beyond that. Um, so the characteristic thing you find in Kant is both, both that he will have that notion and then he'll tell you that you can't know very much about it, right? He's a, he's a limited claims kind of person who will tell you, you know, this thing is there, this is the right concept for this, but you won't know anything more about it than there's a bear, I think. Um, there's some things in, in uh, the last chapter of this book, the Rosen book, um, where he kind of retreats to Kant in a few ways away from his Platonism, um, which we may get to later, but on, I don't, I think he, he Rosen wants to have, there be more understandable mm -hmm. about, uh, about such things than, uh, than, than, than even Kant does. I don't know if that helped, but we should probably keep going around. Yes. Um, uh, Dan, reading and reaction. Yeah, I, I finished the book, I think last time when we, during immediately after last call. So I'm trying to remember some stuff. And um, probably reaction, 
I, I also read a few of Heidegger's book on, on Plato, especially the essence of true, and I just finished the, the sophist, Plato sophist. And this last book, I kind of, I was aware of this book and I tried to see how much like this claim of production is there. And that was there, but I, I found it marginal. This is a book like I think Heidegger wrote a few years before being in time for the courses taught at that time. So it's there, but I, I don't think it's a, it's a major topic in Heidegger. And he's, he's not accusing, at least not to, he's not accusing Plato. He will, he will later accuse like Nietzsche and modernity of production, but not, not so much Plato. And there are a lot of topics there. And as you said, it's pretty much he stays with being, with truth. And it's, it's that kind of, of approach. On the other hand, for example, I, I know like Rosen is accusing Plato, uh, is a, yeah, is accusing Heidegger of reading Plato through Aristotle. I saw that how like in, in the Plato Sophist, it's like the first half of the book, it's, it's about approaching Plato through Aristotle. So it's, that's, that's, that's the case. And let's see what else. Um, this, uh, I read the, the Republic and of course the, 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 the cave allegory. And to me, it's, it is a political, but to me it appears as a, as a, it goes back to how, how we approach to understand ourselves and the, understand truth. And it's, it's more deeper. And it seems like Rosen is, is claiming that that's, it's primarily a, a, a political project for Plato and Heidegger is misreading that and found that a little bit strange. Uh, let's be what, clear. Sorry, let's be careful here. Cause I mean, in, in chapter five, he definitely focuses on the, on the political project of the whole Republic book, but not on the cave allegory. And in four, when he focuses on the cave allegory, he's claiming that it's primarily about not politics, but perception. It's about the human's um, epistemological and, and noetic situation, so to speak, and that it's primarily about perception. Uh, uh, Rosen even calls it the subnatural um, situation of human perception. And he um, uh, considers and rejects the claim that uh, most of the meaning of the, of the of the cave is political. He doesn't see it as getting political until sta stage four, when the one who has been up to sea comes back down into the into the cave. Um, there he sees it being political, but only in the limited sense of the sh it's showing the political situation of philosophy in 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 actual cities. The political situation of philosophy in actual cities is revealed by the uh, stage four when the person who has been up to see the reality on the surface goes back down into the cave and the people inside the cave do not understand him. Um, that's Rosen's reading in four, at least. So he does bring out tons of other political themes in Plato, especially in chapter five, but not all of them are about the allegory of the cave. He's going way beyond the allegory of the cave thing. He's not claiming that the allegory of the cave is primarily a political allegory. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. And Sorry. probably one, one more thing that like, it seems like is this idea that I think you mentioned it last time, like uh, Heidegger's approach to, to Plato is very, very complex and complicated. And at different points, he, he approach him differently. And sometimes he takes like, like in this book that I just finished, like the, the sophist is kind of admiring Plato a lot. Like it's, it's no, no critical at all, almost. And, but I know that there are other books when he, he's, he's more critical. So. And Again, it's, it was a good book. This one at least shows 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 a different approach to to Plato, like the same topic, but a, a different approach when compared with what I'm familiar with, what Heidegger is doing, and that's great. And point some cracks in Heidegger system, and I also like that. But yeah, that's All that's right. it. All right, good first impressions. Thank you, um, Chuck. Chuck, can you hear me? Uh, Jack, are you on mute? Uh, no, I, I'm not on mute. Uh, okay. I can hear you now. I, okay, I've been, sorry. <clears throat> no problem. We were, we were um, asking for first impressions. The, Did you do the reading, all that kind of stuff? Okay. Um, I have only just now finished reading lecture one and lecture two. Uh, I'm finding them interesting. I'm finding the conversation very interesting. And I'm going to report that uh, here at church, which is where I've been today, um, they've been 
the internet was completely down yesterday and it's unstable now. I've had repeated gotcha. warnings that my internet is unstable. And so I don't know what's coming across to you, but what's coming across to me is uh, broken conversations and bits, which I is very frustrating because I know I would benefit from it. So I'm gonna rely on the tape session, which I think will come through clearly. And I'm gonna sign off for now, but I am enjoying the Rosen reading and I okay. will continue, okay? All right. Thank okay. you. Thanks. Bye. Sorry if you had technical okay. difficulties. Okay. Um, yep. yeah, you might, you might okay. try Bye. it with your uh, video turned off because the video takes up a lot of the bandwidth. So you might try the video turned off, see if that's better. Uh, okay. Let me, let me try that just now because I would like sure. to continue listening to the conversation. Absolutely. That's a good idea. So Thanks, Greg. Video. Uh, okay. okay. So video uh, is stopped. I'll see if I'll see if, if the helps. conversation if it helps. Okay. All right. Thank you, um, Jim. Yeah. Okay. So first impressions. I'll never think well, about cows the same way again. You know. <laughs> <laughs> cows. Yes. The idea of yeah. the cow. Right. <laughs> that was really, very odd. It was entertaining though. Um, I. Um, so I guess I'm the opposite. Forget who went first. I loved uh, the uh, chapter four um, because I thought it gave me a different and deeper understanding of the cave. And I'm sure that's going to get deeper, hopefully uh, with, with our discussion of it. Um, I was reading, uh, went back, I had that open. I was reading the cave while I was reading that commentary so I could compare and contrast the two. So um, I was, thought it was, amazing and it, it produced a lot of um new ideas uh for me it made me wonder um i'm really looking forward to finding out uh and i hope this isn't jumping into a question but i'm just uh, that's perception that the primordial perception phase of the of the cave um and how that relates to dot sign because even though we've discussed it a lot and i've read a lot i still never seem to have gotten I can't put my finger on where Heidegger thinks it starts and where it really comes from other than the you know, unconcealment. I mean, that's more like a truth thing though. So I haven't, I've had a hard time. When you say the where it comes from, or which, it, what it are we talking Dasein. about? Dasein. Dasein, okay, yes. It, it, is it, 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 it's pre, but I know he says it's primordial, but then I'm like, okay, it, that, those kind of things have come to mind. And I, I feel like that's sure. getting to a question, a, a formal question, yeah. but. Uh, no, the, I, I, yeah, it's absolutely. Uh, there's definitely deep stuff there in understanding the Dasein concept, which starts off seemingly seeming simpler and like a term for consciousness or something like that in the early Heidegger, especially being in time. Um, but by later on, he's saying, actually, I was actually onto something way more there. And this is a, a deeper concept than I knew at the time. And he will, he, he will elaborate it more and it becomes a more critical term for his thinking, right? Uh, more important, uh, central uh, for his thinking. Um, so that actually, it's important to know that there's a development in Heidegger is what I'm trying to say, right? It's not just yeah. one thing. Now, uh, does, is much of it already there and being in time? Yes, but not, not with the same uh, understanding he has of it later. Um, he just sees, you know, there's intimations of it there that he, later he'll look back on. Um, but the where it comes from, right? There, there's a uh, uh, um, there's an un an underlying notion that uh, the, the Dasein is um, it's an event of appearing, right? It's 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 the there and the being together. There's the being as well as the Dasein, right? Um, but uh, it's like an origin term. So uh, in being in time, it's easily to conflate it with a single consciousness, right? And it's more like the place or site where being happens is the actual formula for it. Um, so anyway, that's, uh, you're right to bring out that that, that is, a, uh, is a core notion in Heidegger and we'll get that in you know, later Heidegger. Um, how is that related to um, uh, primordial consciousness or the cave, right? Um, mm -hmm. The cave is not trying to tell you uh, the origin of consciousness. It's not trying to tell you the origin of human beings. Perception, yeah. 
it's trying to tell you the perceptual situation of okay. human beings in their natural state. And in their natural state means before they know philosophy. Um, so that's because I went into a substance dualism uh, hole there, like between, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, what is a substance? What is a property? What, you know, I went down that hole for like, I don't think it's going there. No, no. So, some of it is because they're, well, at least some of it can be read that way because you can look at some people like some of the later idealists, think of a Hegel, for example. And Hegel will basically say, um, he's an idealist in the sense that uh, he thinks people are living in, in the uh, realm of their thoughts, right? Um, from Plato's point of view, that's the cave. So from Plato's point of view, the, the, the Hegelian is someone who um, thinks it's not possible to leave the cave. And mm. he is going to always live in the cave, right? Um, Rosen makes the point, um, uh, I, forget, I think it's actually at the end of chapter three, that um, the allegory of the cave is a dream of being able to get out of the cave, right? Um, but uh, there's plenty of later, philosophy, uh, later philosophies that would um, uh, accept much of the description of the cave while denying the, 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 the description of the surface. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but, uh, Anyway, uh, we'll we'll get into that when we go through the stages of it. But uh, we're not gonna we're not gonna be able to give you a full in this session, right? A full uh, rundown of uh, Heideggerian Dasein, but we can hope to in the over multiple sessions and lots of reading of more Heidegger. But right, um, okay. So that, that that's the beginning of first impressions. I I loved. Um, I, I each chapter was great. I I preferred the fourth to sixth. Uh, and I guess the sixth I liked, I, I know I joked about the cows, but I thought that was a nice concrete way of, of reorienting throughout the chapter. Um, I, I would like to delve into the Aristotelianizing, Aristot Aristotelianization of Plato yes. uh, that he alluded to. I actually thought, uh, I really like his writing. Every beginning of each chapter, he summarizes what he's already kind of said. Mm -hmm. And that really helps to continue to build uh, for me and understand, okay, great, nice summary. Now we go deeper again. Mm -hmm. um, uh, of course he ends it with, oh, well, sorry. I know I got you. It. It's sort of like he was doing a hider maneuver. I thought it was about to get there. And then like the last chat, the last paragraph, <laughs> he basically says, I don't know, crap, <laughs> something like to that extent. I know that's a more pejorative way to put it, but he was jokingly saying, nah, sorry. <laughs> I can't deliver anymore. I don't really think I know what I'm talking about either. So on to the next book, that kind of a, a vibe was what I was getting at the end. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but it seemed sort of like that. That so like, there, 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 there is some, you know, uh, uh, ph philosophies and uh, endless sort of thing uh, there at the end. Um, it, it actually was his last book, incidentally. Um, I, I, will, I will say that um, Rosen is, is, is sometimes a very clear writer. I would agree actually with Craig that four, chapter four is probably some of his least clear writing in his corpus. Um, uh, but uh, he's always an involved writer. He's always trying to say six things in a sentence. And, and that can be, uh, it can have a sparkle to it. It can, it can make it attractive, but it can also make it very hard to understand, especially if you're loose to a certain uh, uh, standard of logical clarity. It's a it's it's a rhetorical style of writing, not a not a, uh, a clear style of style of writing from a philosopher point of view. But there are other works where he's more on the clear end, um, and th this one he definitely is very frequently trying to pack too many things into one sentence and too many things into one paragraph, so that the by the time you've gotten through two of them, you don't know what just happened, right? <laughs> so I, I I can fully understand what Craig is saying there, and and um, I think part of what you're reacting to, Jim, is the material in chapter four is, is very interesting. I mean, just the, the going through the stages of the cave and thinking about them in detail. And it probably helped you also that you were going back and forth to the cave allegory <laughs> original, which Craig wasn't. Um, so that might have made it uh, easier to follow his jumps, so to speak. Um, Carlos, question. Quick, uh, quick uh, reaction to what you just said earlier. That makes me feel less ignorant because uh, <laughs> all during the time I'm reading this, I'm saying, this guy has a syntax problem. Uh, or I have a problem reading his syntax, but it's it's reassuring to 
here that I'm not the only yes. one. Yes, you're not the only one. That. You're not the only one. Okay. Um, Thank you. Sure. Uh, Darlene, uh, uh, first, thanks for joining us. And did you do the reading and do you have any first reactions? Is Darlene on mute? Okay. Uh, is it Penelope? No, Penelope? All right. Uh, if, if that's the case, then we can consider our first reactions gone through. Um, all right. Uh, shall we talk about the main, the main themes? Um, uh, I, I want to just note, note that um, basically no one in their first reactions mentioned any of the main ideas of chapter five on the political construction stuff. It's like that's the least interesting part to the, to the folks here. Um, the thing which I note in chapter five is um, what I call the retreat to Aristotle. Um, there, there's, there's early on, he was, um, he was um, contrasting Aristotle and Plato and saying that some of these charges of um, uh, truth as correctness um, that he sees Heidegger ascribing to Plato are accurate of Aristotle. Um, in chapter five, he agrees that um, construction is, uh, or productionism, is correctly ascribed to Plato in the realm of politics, not in the realm of truth, right? Uh, but then he also, uh, in his own, the kinds of politics that, 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 that he, uh, he endorses as sane are all retreats to Aristotle, who he finds much sounder. Um, but I noticed that uh, no, no one else, no one else uh, picked up on that or cared, which is maybe a good thing. Um, Okay, but uh, in and out of the cave. The first first question is: is is the is the cave allegory fundamentally a political one, or is it is a philosophical one? I think it's it's fundamentally a philosophical one, almost even a philosophical slash. You know, I don't know. It's a the only other thing that would that, that would fit would be a religious one, right? It's uh, this is why it. it segues so easily to the description of the Gnostics. The idea that we are all um, uh, uh, tra trapped in our perceptions as, as, as though prisoners in a cave, and, uh, but, but that we can be uh, freed to the light uh, by uh, an enlightening liberator um, who might be able to uh, allow us to uh, escape up, up into the light of truth, right? That is um, very close to the, just the, um, the mystical view of the Gnostics that we saw in, 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 in Hans jo, uh, Jonas. I don't know if anyone else picked up on that, but um, I think we mentioned it a little bit with, uh, with Pete. But the, he, he calls it uh, an image of our nature with regard to education and lack of education. Um, uh, so it's not meant to be, um, and this is one of the, um, uh, Rosen's I don't, uh, pain points. It, it's not meant to be a description of everyday existence, so to speak, in the Heidegger sense of the Heidegger being in time, where he contrasts inauthentic everyday existence with, with sort of philosophical understanding, something like that. Um, it's meant, but it is meant to be the the pre-philosophical situation of man. Okay. So what's the what's the core the core thing going on in the allegory of the cave? Um, Jim, how would you put it? What is the what is the cave situation that we're supposed to be in? To me, what I think or what I think Rosen's saying. Uh, what you think Rosen is saying about Plato's putting out there at all? It, it's a little confusing because he starts off by saying this is all about perception, and it sort of a, alludes to a primordial uh, um, context, but then it evolves, it turns into a political one, uh, but only once they, there's a descending back into the cave. That's the point where uh, the enlightened one, the one that's seen the light, uh, tries to help his fellow prisoners or former fellow prisoners who first can't see anything. <laughs> he's ready to fall over. Um, it seems like he's saying that that's the only time the political discussion begins is when that happens. Um, which I thought was interesting because I thought that the puppets 
meant political power over people. And I, I'm still, I'm not sure if I agree with him that that's all you wrestling with yourself to tear yourself away from the deception. Uh, I, one of those things where I'm, I'm trying to figure that out. I, I, I understand what he's saying and I'm like, mm, that's intriguing, but I, it, it's, I'm it's not certainly, sure. It's certainly, it's certainly susceptible to both readings. The other people have definitely read it in a more political way. That's one of the reasons why he's reacting there that way. Yeah. It's entirely <laughs> possible to read the relationship between the puppeteers and the people looking at the shadows uh, in, in, in a more uh, political way than he looks at it. Um, yeah. He points out that the puppeteers uh, are never even said to speak. Right. right. Um, uh, at, at most, some of them emit sounds as they walk behind, which the prisoners ascribe to the objects they're carrying, not to them. So mm. the puppeteers themselves are never seen. Only, yeah. the, pup only the puppets they're holding. Um, but uh, which is not exactly a political relationship, right? <laughs> but yes. But why puppeteers and why the the there, there's something about you're seeing shadows of artifacts. So yep. there's multiple removes from originals. There's like true originals, then there's artifacts which are made copies of them, and then it's only uh, um, outline images, silhouettes of those uh, of those art artificial copies. Right, and he says there's no heavenly bodies that are done that way or represented this way. Or natural so, processes, because all those are outside the cave, right? Yeah. Um, so that means it's a conventional world. Um, <clears throat> and it's the, the, the part which um, I, do, I find Rosen doesn't stress, but which to me is one of the clear subtexts of that part of the cave allegory is some of this actually being related precisely to language, right? Yeah, thing, I was the, gonna ask about, I'm sorry, I was gonna ask uh, about Wittgenstein because of that, because uh, he's basically, that was his moment uh, around that era. Uh, I don't know much about him, but I read a little bit because yeah, yeah, it was connected, but I was wondering if that- they, I, I, don't want, I, don't, I don't want to get there yet. Okay. I want to just stick with the, with the Plato for a second, right? Okay, okay. okay. In, in, in the Plato, right, you've got um, man-made artifacts that are themselves images or copies of natural things. And mm -hmm. What we see is um, outlines or images thrown by those by those artif artificial things. If you think only in terms of um, perceived words, words are artifacts made by prior generations of human beings. Right? They they categorize the world. Right? They they um, collect things into kinds. Right? but they don't collect things into kinds in, uh, um, uh, just perceptually, so to speak. There is con there's a conventionality to them as well. They are made things. Um, so the something like the word or the concept is already this uh, artificial made collection. And then the perceived, and perceived used word is only a shadow of that, right? So one of the ways in which we are um, in a cave-like existence is to the extent that we are, that our thoughts are informed by, conducted in, and are, and are actually even about other people's words, right? Rather than the realities to which the words should refer, right? So in all of these cases, you have, um, you have this, you're focusing on the medium that the message is coming through rather than the message coming through, right? And, and how many links in that that are hiding uh, what, what is original or behind all of it. And, and that's the fundamental, if I can do it that, that way, the fundamental platonic epistemological point, if I can do it that way, right? Which is that the perceptuals themselves are only information stand-ins for the noetic realities. But the noetic realities are not at all words, right? In fact, the words are closest to the puppets, right? Hmm. So, yeah. um, this is this is why there's some. It's clear to me that in Plato, there is no attempt to replace um, direct experience of truth with a linguistic understanding in a you know in a positivist way, something like that, in a late positivist way. 
right? The 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 purely linguistic understanding is is closer to where we're starting, where we just have carved uh, uh, carved artifacts of household utensils. The household utensils that have these things are all thought of as tools, right? The 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 the, the term is, is is you know the household utensil. It's almost the word for tool, right? So, um, and what is a car, what is a what is a puppet that is a, of, a, of a tool, right? So someone has someone has artificially carved something to represent something else, but the thing that is representing is is is, is an object of use. So you're you're productionist at two removes, right? Um, so you have utility built into it, utility and and production for use built into it multiple ways. So all of that is instead of being the standard of truth is treated as being in the first stage of the, of the allegory, exactly what we're buried in, exactly what's, what is separating us from the thing we were actually originally trying to think about. Um, okay, so to me, the, the, the first stage is a person who um, can only think in other people's words, right? Doesn't have any words of his own, he has other people's words, and he can only see what the other people's words say about the things that the other pe that the other people's words acknowledge to exist. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now you can think of that as uh, uh, either a stage of uh, an epistemological stage. You can also think of it as a developmental stage if you want to. Right. Um, but. Uh, I don't think Plato primarily means it's a developmental stage, but there may be some correspondence there. Um, obviously, in actual development, we have plenty of our direct perceptions as well to work with uh, before we try to connect them to words. But our concepts probably first come from other people's words, not our own. Yeah. Um, okay, just some reactions to that first stage in the in the word interpretation, Carlos. Yes, he's trying to free the mind. Sorry. Yeah. You asked earlier if, if the allegory was philosophical or political. Well, to me, it's philosophical. I mean, first of all, it, it, the, it, the entire scene is very convolutively constructed. You know, these people are shackled and they can't turn. They don't even know there's somebody next to them and so on. Um, now, whether it can be the results of pondering it as a philosophical allegory, can be instrumental in gaining some insight into the political situation on a, on a, on a hypothetical political situation. That's another thing. But it, uh, and after hearing what you just said uh, about the whole uh, allegory, it's, it's entirely, I mean, it's, it, he constructed it to force somebody to see things that otherwise would be very difficult to see or to appreciate, like you're saying, you know, the, the noetic thing. Mm -hmm. The words being uh, words being artifacts that somebody else came up with that you can use to express yourself if you can. Uh, that's all very philosophical and epistemological. Yes, I mean the, he he himself does not call them words. He he keeps it visual, right? He actually yeah. only mentions um, some of the people walking behind, sometimes emitting sounds to like imitate the sounds of the of the of the animals that, whose icons they're 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 they're. they're uh, drawing by whatever but uh okay so so i think one of the reasons that people there's two at least two reasons why people well three reasons why people think of this as have must must have a political meaning must yeah um one it's occurring in the middle of a dialogue the republic which is an entirely political subject matter right um <clears throat> but that's not particular to the allegory itself it's just sort of a contextual thing people are already expecting that the other is the the description of the uh uh puppeteers that display things that other people see and take for reality is uh, it, it, it is a construct but it, it's it's the kind of construct that a certain kind of political mind is expecting to be a politically freighted thing right because they see they, they think of that as a a characteristic description of an aspect of, of political reality right um so they're expecting a political meaning um and the third is that some, in some places there is some of the language of this, of you know, uh, the, the 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 slaves and puppeteers and those those sorts of terms be, being read uh, not as the sing, sing, single descriptors that they are for that stage of the of, of of the allegory, but being read with their 
come to this way, more common sense political meetings. Um, I think all those are thin reasons. And I think Rosen does a good job of bringing out how in each of the transitions from one stage of the allegory to the next, things which you might think of as being stable elements of the environment, according to that interpretation, just disappear. Like once the guy stands up and turns around, there are no more puppeteers. Puppeteers are not mentioned at all, right? All that's mentioned is the firelight, the objects that they were carrying and, uh, uh, and, 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 and the shadows, right? Uh, and, the, and the choices between them. There's no mention whatsoever of the puppeteers at that point. All the conversations are hypothetical, right? Um, mm -hmm. And when he uh, uh, goes up outside, the people left down in the cave are not divided into classes. When he goes back down to the cave, he's not going to war with the puppeteers to free the slaves, nothing like this, right? He's just trying to free, free, the, free the inhabitants of the cave in toto, right? Um, that second, that last part may be political, more political than the first one, but the first one I see as a, as an instrument to enlighten the individual into seeing, yes. perceiving the truth a little better, and what he does with that later, maybe a little more political. Perhaps, but the 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 uh, Rosen's Rosen's point is that he he Rosen only sees something fundamentally political in stage four when the person goes back, right. And before then, he sees only um, epistemological meaning kind of yeah. things, philosophical meaning kind of things. OK, um, <clears throat> another point that Rosen spent a lot of time on is just the, the correspondence or lack of correspondence between the, the world below and the world above, um, meaning inside the cave and outside the cave. Um, he thinks that Heidegger, and you know how accurate this is, we, we can determine for ourselves, uh, th thinks or claims that the outside is meant to mirror the inside, that the uh, the uh, idea of the good, the sun, uh, the idea of the good or the, in the sun is definitely said to have to correspond above to the fire uh, below the, as the caster of the light in which things are seen, right? Um, but that's the only direct correspondence between the above and the below worlds that's given. Um, uh, there's no, there's nothing corresponding to puppeteers in the upper world, right? Um, the things experienced in the upper world are natural objects, not artifacts. Um, there are shadows in the upper world, but they're shadows cast by things that are directly attached to them, not detached from them and, and perceived as though they were their own thing. Okay. Um, I want to point out one other fact about shadows that people might not, you know, might not be obvious, but a shadow is a place that without light, a shadow is a place that's dark. And what does it preserve? The outline of a thing, right? It's a silhouette, right? The only, only information you get from a shadow is a silhouette and even a distorted silhouette, okay? But the, the silhouette is the thing that it preserves. The silhouette is the outline. The outline is the definition. The definition is the form. The form is the idea. So, to the extent that, an, that, that a shadow is, a, is, a, is, a, is a, a shadow is something fake, ephemeral, not the real thing, and a, uh, a very thin substitute for the real thing throughout the allegory. But it also is the, the only thing, only information that it preserves is shape, definition. And that in the end is Plato's own definition of the definiteness of things. Things are definite because they're definite, because they have definition, because they have shape, right? Um, okay, so I, I don't, my point is I don't think it's a, uh, it's not at all an accident that Plato picked not a copy of something in a mirror, but picked shadow as the thing he would use to make this point. Um, and that means that there, and this is a point that Heidegger himself brings out in the stuff we'll be reading later, there is truth even in the cave. Um, it's not the case that someone in the cave doesn't see anything, right? It's not, it's not even the case that what they see is not, uh, does not convey truthful information to them, right? Um, okay. But they certainly don't see uh, everything, the most important things, things as, as, things as they are. Okay. Uh, next important thing. Um, this is... Uh, Glaucon's reaction to the description of 
uh, life in the cave, being freed from the cave and above or below, right? And uh, the, this Rosen points this out as um, practically quoting Homer um, that uh, you prefer the life of a penniless serf above to that of a king below. So the original in, 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 uh, in uh, Homer of that is that it's uh, when uh, Odysseus visits the underworld and talks to um, uh, uh, Achilles, who's in Haiti, um, in Hades, right? So, um, and uh, Achilles is lamenting his fate, right? And he would rather be uh, a penniless serf alive rather than uh, a king below. So the um, Glaucon is likening the cave existence to the Hades or underworld existence as uh, popularly understood in, 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 in Greek. Uh, Greek religion. Why? Why is this death to 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 Balkan? No one no one envies the cave dwellers, right? But what is it particularly that they lack? Light. Sorry. Light. They lack light. They have a little bit of firelight behind them. But the main thing that they lack is true perception. It's it's the they're de they're deprived of truth. They're truth starved, right? The, the the claim is to live truth starved is to be dead. To 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 live without full truth is a kind of living death. That's the fundamental claim of the whole story. It's uh, it's a. Uh, Man lives by truth before he lives by bread. Is the kind of is the kind of uh, underlying statement here, and and that's the actual motive behind uh, uh, thinking of leaving the cave as liberation, right? There's no claim that if you're up above, you're in a a perfect place, only that you know the place that you're in, right? Um, and a place that you know that you're in, you can see accurately. Is so much better than a place where you're uh, uh, shackled and uh, uh, shackled in the dark and deprived of truth. That it is a it is a alive, dead, heaven, hell kind of distinction of truthful existence versus untruthful existence. Carlos, once I'm out there and uh, under the sun and everything else, you could claim that I'm in a simulation. That's just complicating the issue. But what I'm driving at is that the allegory applies to us. It could, it could absolutely. But I mean, uh, on, honestly, all the all the simulation claims and matrix ideas are copies of this allegory. It's the original. <laughs> okay. Right. But Plato's cave is the original matrix. Right. Um, and and they're all okay. copying him, not the other way around. So but, we can't get rid of that possibility that we are in the cave. Uh, to Plato, you can, but you can ask yourself whether that's a, that, that's a, that, that's a, uh, a dream or a dream or reality, but the, from Plato's point of view, I think, um, philosophy is, is philosophy triple equals is defined by that attitude towards the importance of truth. Right. Um, and it's not an accident that it occurs in the middle of the Republic because the Republic is, you know, a couple of uh, young guys come to Socrates and say, prove to us that it's better, better to be just than to be unjust. And they're, th and they're thinking of just as uh, obeying the laws of the city and they're thinking of unjust as uh, trying to be tyrants and uh, get all the power, the power they can, right? And, uh, Plato does not react to them by telling them stories about how much better their lives will, will be if they're just. He tells them this story instead, which is more like telling them, um, by the way, he's also gonna paint, paint them a picture of political justice that will you know, uh, uh, make the hair on the back of your neck stand up, right? So he, he's, he's uh, not presenting the political life as being all that attractive. Uh, and he's definitely painting the tyrannical life as being one of the least attractive of, of even of all the political lives, but all the political lives are more like life in the cave. 
so his 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 way of uh, reacting to the to the question of should I be just or should I be tyrannical is something like political life is of a, a living death of an ant. Right? Here's philosophy instead. So, I mean that that to me is the is the fundamental uh, the fundamental message of the of the of the cave allegory and why it occurs, where it occurs in the dialogue, and 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 as it occurs in the dialogue. And I think it's fair to say that Heidegger gets that. Heidegger understands the um, the um, philosophical liberation aspect of what the of what the story is about. Um, Dan, question. Yeah, well, well, uh, I, I remember now uh, reading the previous book, there is uh, Heidegger is mentioning Plato saying something like, I think he's in, in the Sophist, I read that way back, but I don't remember it. So it says something like Plato is complaining that we meet the, the materialists. Like, I think he is not exactly the materialist, but something like that. And they say for them, all you, all you see is all you get. If you cannot touch it, you cannot see it. It's, there, is nothing, there is nothing more than that. And Plato is complaining, saying we cannot talk with them because to them, that's all. And you cannot have a discourse going beyond that. While idealists, they have their own problems, but at least they accept there is something there that you cannot, you cannot grab, you cannot see, you cannot sense. And I think to me, it is what you said about empty words and outlines and so on, but it's also about this, that there is something more than what you get there on the, what you see. There is something that you need to, to go beyond what you see and what you perceive to, to, to get the truth. It's still about truth, but yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of this that it goes beyond what you see. You need somehow to go beyond that, but not in a, in a I don't know, metaphysical or transcendental way, but there is something there that you need to, I don't know, look around the corner and see what's there if you can. But that's a, it's, it's a complicated process. And again, maybe it's philosophical, it's political, but. To me, that's also the message is there that we need to, to figure out what's beyond or behind that everything we see and perceive. I agree with all that. For those who may not know the part of the sophist he's talking about. So um, this is um, the, uh, the Parmenidean stranger is uh, describing the, what he calls the gigantomachia, the war of the, the war of the giants over being. And he says there are two camps, and one is the camp of the, he calls the materialists, but they're also like the Fluxus and the uh, all this change people, and their leader is Heraclitus. And they believe that uh, um, what you see is what you get. There is matter in motion, and that describes everything, everything that there is, right? Um, and there's another army, which uh, believes instead in being, and their leader is Parmenides. And they believe that besides the material, there is also life and mind and do not equate life and mind with the material right so, so soul soul and intellect soul and mind and mind mind and truth are also kind of going together as being things which are beyond the becoming beyond the sphere of becoming beyond the sphere of the material and beyond the sphere of the perceptibles is the other side of the war of the giants over being in the sophist, right? Those are the two camps. And uh, the Parmenidean uh, stranger says, uh, we have to come down on the side of Father Parmenides in that camp that says there is, there are not only the perceptibles, but there's also life and, uh, and mind. Um, but he does present that as being the, the sort of fundamental debate struggle between them. The other thing that immediately comes out of that, though, is he's he's uh, is kind of asked or you know goes to, um, what would they agree upon, the, these two camps? What what would count as being, to both of these two camps? And that's where you get the notion that uh, uh, something like a the power to affect or be affected, is the thing that they would agree upon. And so. This isn't quite productionist metaphysics, but it is an element towards productionist metaphysics, and it's an element towards the, if I come to this way, the um, the notion of uh, of a power or an energy uh, as being the thing, the nature that something has, 
right? Something's nature is its powers, right? It's what it can do or, or have done to it. That is presented in the sophist, not as simply the truth about being, but as the thing you could get the two warring camps about being to agree upon. It's like a lowest common denominator that we recognize by both sides. That's how that's presented in the sophist. So um, uh, can you talk to the people who say there is no, um, there is no life and there is no mind? And th th the claim is, you know, one, no, you can't really talk to them, but also they claim that they're not there to talk to. So what's the problem? <laughs> 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 so anyway, that's uh, I, I, that's one of the um, deeper passages in the in this office. Darlene, question. Oh, she said she had to go. I have to I have to leave my computer, so I was just waving goodbye. Okay. I'm just trying to be polite. Uh, great. I, I might be able to get back on in half an hour. We'll we'll see. Okay. okay. We'll see if we're still going, but we'll keep recording, and you can check it out later if you want. Yeah, I've been listening uh, with the with the the Bluetooth um, while doing some stuff. The Understood. Okay, bye. All right. Thank you. Bye. Um, okay, uh, Pete, did you have a hand up for a question or a comment? Yeah. Uh, no. I mean, uh, so I regarding the political. Uh, besides the leaving the cave and coming back and trying to free the people. I, I, I see the polit political earlier on. Uh, uh, Plato talks about just turning the prisoner to stop looking at the shadows and look at the lantern. And he calls that paideia, education. But I see that education as a political act not necessarily to grab people, take them out into the world of the ideas and the sun, but just to turn them around and see that it's a lantern that's creating uh, the shadows. And that I see as political uh, part of this. It's fair. I mean, the, the, the point that Rosen makes is that every stage of the upward journey, it's something like a compulsion applied. Um, in the case of the initial act of standing up, there's no origin given for it. Um, in the case of the turning around, as you say, it is it, it is you know a, a forceful act that some other unspecified person does, um, and being dragged up to the light it is all presented as a hypothetical. If he were dragged up, this is what he would experience, right? Um, it's never presented as something which the person is you know affirmatively doing themselves because they know where they want to go to, right? Um, they wouldn't know where they want to go to. Um, they don't know the other things are there, right? Um, and even when turned around to look at the at the at the firelight or the lantern, um, uh, he immediately wants to look, turn back to looking at the shadows because the light hurts his eyes and he can't understand what he's seeing, whereas he can understand the shadows because he's used to them, right? So there's a notion that uh, there of um, understanding is first of all only of the familiar. Now, obviously that's recursive and you can't have only understanding the familiar. You have to at some point if that understanding is so much unfamiliar, right? And obviously he can learn as, he's, as he experiences these new things, um, but it's, it's against the grain to, uh, to, to doubt the shadows. It's against mm -hmm. the grain to uh, uh, drag up the steep way and in, in, into the light. It's disorienting. All of it is presented as uh, being the opposite of an easy and natural course. Right, and it's education, and so education is a political act to teach people to recognize things besides the profiles. Sure, and, and in in uh, in in the sorry, R Rosen talks us about, uh, a lot about the republic and about the statesman in in this, and he never mentions the laws, right? But in the laws, which is you know uh, Plato's other big thing. The, the, the chief magistrate of the of the of the entire state, the, the highest office and the most important one, is the head of education. Right, uh, it's uh, Plato regards the person who uh, institutes the education uh, regime for a city as the most important person in the city. It's like the, the position of the founder, the position of the prophet, is the position of the educator. Um, 
and the 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 uh, closest you get to that here is the um, uh, Plato himself, as the as the writer of the dialogue, is 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 being that kind of uh, that kind of poet. He's he's the R Rosen points out uh, later that um, the poets are exposed because they compete with the the, the role of Plato, not because uh, he he just likes poetry, but because it's going to be his poetry, um, something like that. Um, but that he's he's doing the same thing. Um, uh, but so yes, ed education is the uh, the philosophically political act, but the philosophically political act is to see uh, education as it's not even education for this for politics or about politics. It's almost education away from politics. It's towards truth and and and, and uh, but yeah. Uh, again, that's the typical philosophical view, right? The philosophical view is first of all that uh, truth is so important that life without it is uh, not worth living, something like that. And then that the most important political thing is simply education towards truth, reorientation towards truth, um, from which the person doing that expects no particular political effects whatsoever. They're not doing it for the political effects. They're doing it to get people to uh, uh, live in the truth rather than in the cave. And, but or then that. it'll lead to virtue, which is where they started, right? Will it lead to, lead to virtue? Will it lead to virtue? So that, that's a, and that's one of the points that uh, Rosen is bringing out in chapter five. So we can maybe segue to that, right? So in, in chapter five, um, uh, where it's about all about political production, um, Rosen is pointing out that uh, Plato is a radical compared to someone like an Aristotle. Aristotle thinks that um, um, mo moderate political uh, uh, practical wisdom will lead to political virtue, will lead to the political good, something like that. Um, all, with, all within the within the sphere of politics. Politics is natural enough that it's going to, um, it has its own internal standards of the right practical life. And it's just, you know, there's, there's the, uh, the, the, the highest type in the, of, of the practical man in the, in the ethics is the great souled man. He's the political man, right? Um, in that sense, Aristotle treats politics as a self-contained thing with its own excellence. It doesn't need sort of outside help to achieve its, its own excellence. Plato is not that way at all. Um, Plato does not think that the, uh, that the political life attains a human excellence on its own. He thinks that the political life is kind of uh, uh, sick and at war with itself between the the the, uh, the temperate and the angry, or the uh, passionate and the uh, and, and the moderate, um, the hard and the sharp, uh, hard, hard and sharp versus the uh, uh, tender and gentle, whatever. Um, and these these are both there in the two types in the um, need to be woven together in the statesman, and they're there in the music and gymnastic. Uh, sides of the education uh, of the guardians in the Republic, et cetera. So there's, there's a, the point is, Rosen is pointing out, there's a kind of radicalism about what politics needs from outside of itself, so to speak, in Plato that you don't see in Aristotle. Um, Pete, did you have another question? I can't tell if your hand is still up or went up again. I am not sure how to... Make it come down? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think you said it again, but... No, I mean, I, I turned it on through the reactions. Oh, I see. I how to turn it off. Okay, it's fine. Uh, did you have any further reactions to, to that politics? No, stuff no? just okay. ignore my hand. Okay, okay. <laughs> All right, uh, uh, any other thoughts? Sorry, Dan. Going back to, to the political, I remember in the, the previous book, like I think the essence of truth, it's it's some there is a passage or a section where Heidegger talks about like the the the, the city or the the or the city as the, the the location of being, like it's the it's the place where, where truth happens. And I think we with these days we for us politics is not is no longer we don't have any 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 grasp of it as it used to be for the Greeks like they go like when they like for them politics and philosophy or kind of went together they 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 discuss it and they they whatever they did they 
like that's why they need to 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 get the true out of each other and to to to, to force true out of concealment and that was by also politics by at the same time so for us to 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 split them and to see them as separate phenomena probably that's because we are moderns and we we don't we don't see that anymore and i think if i remember like i don't know Arendt, for example is it's talking a lot how the, the the politics is what was for the greeks is was completely different from what is to us these days for us is abstract is representative is it's we just vote that's all we we <laughs> we, we say yes or no to issues we, we no longer participate we don't we don't pull them out of their un, i don't know issues out of unconcealment we, a bunch of technicians giving us options and we say no or yes to them and but anyway no i i understand what you're saying there but i think that um it's not just us drawing that distinction i think that plato is also drawing that distinction i, I i'm absolutely sure that uh aristotle is drawing that distinction in the in the ethics there's two different ideal human types there's the theoretical man and, and the practical man and the great souled man is not the philosopher and the philosopher is not the great souled man and there, there, there's directly pointing to two different peaks. And in uh, Plato, there's the same uh, dichotomy, but there's not two peaks. The political peak is missing. Instead, you get the notion of the philosopher king um, uh, who is not going to be all that participatory for the people who aren't philosopher kings. Um, so uh, I, I agree with you that our politics has changed. I agree with you that the average Greek would, had you know, a, a sense of participation in it way different than ours. And if you were reading Thucydides or if you were um, contemplating you know, uh, Pericles, all of what you said would be fair and accurate. It's the kind of thing you reflection you get from a Burkhardt or something. But I don't think that it's true of the philosophers. The philosophers are outliers in this. They're not like the other Greeks. The philosophers are making a distinction that we now take almost for granted as moderns, but they're the ones making it, right? Um, for better or worse, they they are uh, sharply dividing philosophy from the political life. Uh, there there are plenty of historians who think that they were doing that because political life seemed to be failing and and they were you know giving up on it and they were kind of withdrawing to philosophical life. And people like uh, Hans Jonas thinks that the the later um, uh, religious uh, uh, reform of ancient world was even more of a retreat in that in that same direction before, because politics seemed to have failed. But um, th something like that has already started in with Plato and Aristotle, I think. Well, probably for Plato, is, I think he started like that, but after he failed, whatever it was two incidents when he got in trouble with politics, probably he, he started to separate philosophy from politics and same with Aristotle and the entire philosophical tradition after after that yeah. point. Aristotle uh, famously had, well, not famously, Aristotle had two big interventions in politics. The first intervention in politics is he just taught Alexander. He, he, he thought that the way that a philosopher um, influences politics is education, as Pete said. He, he just taught Alexander and then hands off, let Alexander do what Alexander is going to do. Then after he had done that, when, when Alexander dies, he gets accused of having uh, sided with the uh, e evil foreign tyrant who overthrew Athens by the people in, in Athens. And they gave him you know, the same choice of uh, death or exile that was presented to Socrates. But uh, he doesn't stay and drink the hemlock, he goes to Thessaly, right? So there's, there's uh, Aristotle's revisions are just teach the king, don't try to be the king. And then uh, uh, if they if the city uh, offers you exile, take it. <laughs> There's all these ways in which Aristotle is a, is a common sense retreat from from some of this intransigence that you get in in, in Plato and uh, in Socrates. Um, but but fair reflections. Um, I will say there are places in the in some of the Heidegger stuff where he's talking about this where he he. Um, uh, he kind of sugarcoats the uh, uh, some of the elements, some of the political elements in in Plato. He's like not entirely comfortable with some of the political elements in Plato. Um, uh, uh, so he says something like, you know, when he's talking about the uh, philosopher king, he doesn't mean that the that the philosophy professor should uh, should should rule the state. No, no, nothing like that. That would be that would be extreme and absurd. When in fact, that's exactly what Plato means. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, 
a, a better guide on that is uh, with, is uh, uh, George Bernard Shaw. Uh, if you if you go read the, the play Major Barbara, you'll get a reflection on this. Um, anyway, um, the other thing I want to bring out there in the political section is there's a contrast that Rosen makes between um, Plato's sense of the political and Heidegger's sense of the historical. Uh, he's he's basically saying one is political and yet whereas the other is, is historical. The the he's saying you don't find uh, uh, you can't imagine Plato talking about the metaphysical destiny of Athens. You can easily imagine Heidegger talking about uh, in, in those terms, right? Um, historical destiny is not the kind of thing that Plato is exercised about. It is the kind of thing that Heidegger is exercised about. Um, whereas political arrangements of uh, 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 musical and gymnastic education are not the kinds of things that Heidegger is exercised about. <laughs> um, Okay, but I mean, I, I think it's I think that's a fair a fair contrast between them, and and to me that's part of the 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 turn that um, the moderns have taken that's there in Nietzsche and is also still there in Heidegger towards the uh, the historical and the ph philosophically historical as the plane on which they think something like politics plays out, right? Um, that isn't there yet in, in Plato. Okay, um, so at least a couple other things I wanted to get to. Uh, uh, ideas made or discovered. This is uh, what we get to in the, the part that Craig was most interested in at the end, uh, that is the third chapter. Um, uh, What's the issue? The issue is there are places in, in uh, Plato where you get these elaborate uh, um, theoretical constructions. And uh, you've got on the one hand, this um, pay on to initial, initial uh, noetic intuition. But on the other hand, he's always giving you some uh, little piece of linguistic and technical construction. Um, so are our ideas made, because the technical constructions certainly are, or are they discovered, right? And this is bringing us back to the whole question of, you know, to what, do, to what extent is there a productionist metaphysics in, in Plato? Um, but to, I think to address this, you first have to bring in the third man. To me, Nietzsche is the third man in this argument, right? The, there's a, there's a, a thing going on here where some of what um, Heidegger is seeing in Plato, he's seeing there because Nietzsche pointed it out or alleged that it was there. And some of what uh, Rosen is reacting to is not like not agreeing with what Nietzsche thinks about Plato, not with what Heidegger thinks about Plato. Um, okay, why does this matter? The, the, um, I'm thinking of, where is this, is the beginning of five? Um, Right, the question is, uh, okay, so this is on, on page 89 under, he's summing up the previous chapter really. Um, uh, the replacement of thinking by philosophy, the dyad, Plato, Aristotle, the origination of the transformation into philosophy of language. All right, so what's the third paragraph down? In sum, human beings produce their world through the reconstruction of eidetic vision as predicative discourse. Knowing is making, but making is itself directed by the will. Okay, so um, the restlessness of ingenuity drives autonomy ever closer to closer anarchy. The point of that is that is not something that's being ascribed to Plato. That's a diagnosis of someone like Nietzsche, right? The subtext here is this is a claim about where the actual history of the West goes, right? And th the claim is that not that uh, Plato believed that knowing was making, but that in fact knowing is making. And whether he uh, knows it or not, acknowledges it or not, signs his bills or not, Plato is doing the making here, right? So the, and that's a Nietzschean claim, right? The Nietzschean claim is that the, is that the, um, the ancient philosophers who thought they were merely discovering uh, eternal truths about the bones of the world were in fact legislating they were in fact um, creating the categories that later philosophy uses, and they were 
legislative poets more than they were um, impartial scientists investigating empirical reality and discovering truth, if that makes sense. And that's not a claim about what they wanted to be doing, it's a claim about what they were actually doing. And the person making that claim is not Heidegger, it's Nietzsche, right? Carlos. Isn't that inevitable or unavoidable? At some point, you mean if you are you know, starting with a blank slate and no humanity, just one brain, whatever you come up with is going to be interpreted downstream as your manufacturer. Yes, it can be interpreted that way, but the question is, is that what it was, right? So the fact that someone like Nietzsche is gonna come along and is going to interpret Plato and Aristotle as having been legislators and makers, not discoverers, absolutely. But is he right? That's the question. Were they, were they makers or were they discoverers? Did they find truths that we can still regard as true or did they just make something which was their construction which, which we can replace with our construction as soon as our will changes and our purposes change? The latter is Nietzsche's position, right? And you can go through a whole bunch of these previous things where um, Rosen is objecting, oh, that's not what Plato meant. Oh, that's not what Plato meant, right? Plato didn't say this, you know, but Plato says you, you, ideas cannot be both eternal and produced. And Nietzsche's like, okay, fine, they're not eternal. But wait, I said right here that they were eternal, so that's not what I meant. Well, so what? They're, they're not actually eternal. We don't actually believe in, you know, those sorts of things, right? So uh, you tell me that the idea of the bed is grown in the garden by a god. There are no god, there are no uh, uh, bed growing gardener gods, right? Uh, in fact, Beds were invented by men. And mm. all you're doing is telling me you don't know who, which one it was, but I know that it was invented by a man, right? This is the Nietzschean move on all of these claims that this is, whenever, whenever you, know, you make a claim that that's not what Plato meant, that's not what Plato said, that he intended something else. He was trying to talk about the eternal. He was trying to talk about uh, a discovery. He wasn't trying to talk about making. Nietzsche is just standing there going, uh-huh, uh-huh. If you believe that, you'll believe anything. You made it, own up. So that, that's the third man subtext here, right? That challenge is being leveled at Plato and Aristotle and, 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 and you know, the ancient notion of philosophy generally by Nietzsche, right? And that is where this metaphysics of production is really coming from. It's not coming particularly from uh, Aristotle, you know, inventing logic or something. It's coming from the idea that knowing is making and making is directed by the will. That's Nietzsche. And Craig. Does this continue on on the uh, yeah, one area that I had flagged was page 93, where he does the direct uh, um, question of the relation between Aristotle's physics and, and uh, Nicomachean ethics? Yes. Is that still the Nietzsche that he's, that he's dealing with there? Um, partly. Partly, um, he's also he's also okay. There's a separate issue he's trying to address there, which is whether or not he's he's also there just pointing out a disagreement between Aristotle and Plato. The disagreement between Aristotle and Plato he's pointing out there is that Aristotle trusts nature more than Plato does. Um, trusts nature to be normative and correct, and Plato is more like um, nature may show may 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 point you in a direction, but it's also going to. Uh, uh, it's not going to get you there, and it can easily uh, be, be messed up instead. Um, the, the, is that the same point about will directing? Someone could read Plato that way. I don't think Plato himself thinks that, but, some, but certainly Nietzsche could read Plato that way. Um, that uh, his idea of the good is a mask of his will. Um, or willfulness, but still of a need for a the top thing to be a kind of um, directing legislative uh, command, right? But that the top thing is a, is, a, is is a command is 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 Nietzsche's fundamental contention here. I think the disagreement he's talking about in ninety three though is fundamentally between Plato and Aristotle on nature and whether or not nature provides full standards in itself. Yeah, the next sentence where he says it is still a matter of controversy whether or how much of the theoretical workings of nature 
must be known in order to understand the nature of praxis. Um, the issue there is uh, is kind of to me flipped back to our ability to understand nature, not necessarily nature itself. Um, our our sure. preconceived notions about what nature is, um, you know, and that that as a scientist I see all the time. You know, the uh, once a paradigm set in place, that's what nature is until the paradigm gets shattered by the fact that that paradigm was wrong. And so, so I'm still trying to uh, tie in a little bit to, to that about these generalizing statements about nature, when at this point, it's really more about our level and limits of understanding of nature or how we relate to nature. Yes, the, 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 there's still a fundamental disagreement between the Plato version of that and the Nietzsche version of that. There, the, the play, you're right that um, on either side of it, you can have too overconfident a sense that you've gotten to the bottom already, that you've, you, know, that you don't, will, you'll, will never have to do another revision. But Pl Plato is open to, um, the Platonic view is open to there being more discoverable about nature that way, but it's always discovered. It's never constructed. And the Nietzschean view is all, all, you all, all you ever have is your constructs and they're always gonna be constructs. There is no bottom and you're not gonna to get to it because it's not a bottom, it's a tool. And because it's a tool you made for your purposes and your purposes are changing, of course your paradigms are gonna change. So, but that's fundamentally the constructivist productionist view, the Nietzschean view. Um, it has a way of dealing with that fact about the fact that paradigms change, the fact that our knowledge shifts, right? It, it, it's um, very much at home with that. It's not expecting it to ever end because it doesn't have faith in any of them, really, right? Um, but Platonism lives or dies with the dream that you can actually guess the bones behind the world and know the way it actually works. And that means even if you know your guess could be wrong and might have to be revised, you're still trying to guess the way it actually works. Right? You, you don't think of yourself as just constructing something which will be useful for now as a partial description of how it works. If you're doing that, you're not trying to get to the actual answer. So that kind of puts you into a, a, a real problem with uh, how, you, how you get to virtue and how you get to, to good. If, if there's no foundation underneath either one of them. Uh, yes, we'll come back to that in a second. Joe had a question. Uh, yeah, I'm just trying to clarify. Uh, it seems to me you just made a clear distinction between somehow the, the essence of the reality uh, is something that's uh, far more fundamental than any model of the reality that might be constructed by a human mind. And even though Nietzsche would argue that no, the model that you constructed, your positing of your of your virtues and your and your hierarchy of values is uh, is all there is. Uh, mm -hmm. Whereas Plato is claiming there's a greater essence behind all of it, a reality as it were. Mm -hmm. And I infer maybe Heidegger saying it is into that reality in which the sign is thrown. Um, comment? So I think that uh, Heidegger is on uh, the platonic side of that in the sense that he thinks that uh, there is, there is, it is possible to touch uh, that reality, but only, and this is maybe uh, touches Craig's point. It, it gets hard when we bring in Heidegger because he's 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 agreeing with the uh, there being a level of philosophical truth that can be touched that way, but he is also agreeing with Nietzsche about how historical the perspectives are, and therefore how uh, changeable they are. That the the the, the shifting the shifting uh, image will change. The, the context of the event in which the appearing occurs cannot. It's, it's, yeah, but it's the, what's shifting, hang on. What's shifting in Heidegger's model is, uh, you know, sort of like you might call the evolution of knowledge as we're adding more facts and modifying the basic model, like, like Kuhn was talking about. Well, Kuhn is, uh, is, is, uh, more on the Nietzschean end of the spectrum, but, but, uh, Yes, he, he, yes, Heidegger is, is trying to say that. And yes, that's compatible with a platonic notion of just having revision, revisions of, uh, of, of understood truth. Heidegger is way more historicist than, than, than a Plato there, way more historicist. Um, 
So uh, on, on the level of the, of, of the content of the uh, truth in a given epoch of metaphysics or something like that, uh, he's, more of a, he's more on the Nietzsche camp of the historicist camp, but not because he thinks that the scene of this, all this action interaction is made. He thinks the scene of all this interaction can be discovered like, like truth. Um, but these are, these, are the, these are the subtle distinctions on top of the first just seeing the dyad, the Plato-Nietzsche dyad, because much of what Rosen is reacting to here are claims being made about Plato that seem to violate the sort of intention of Plato. But the reason that those are being ascribed to him anyway is it's Nietzsche saying, that's what you are actually doing. I don't care what you say you were doing. That's what you were actually doing. The things you say you were doing aren't possible. So they not, aren't what you were doing. Right. Joe? Right. Yeah, it just, uh, I had a very silly, amusing thought as you were finishing up there. Uh, it's as if uh, Ayn Rand is a Platonist and very anti-Nietzsche, contrary to the normal <laughs> accusations. Uh, maybe on some of the truth things, yes. Uh, on all the political things, the other way around. Um, well, the, the claim reality exists. Hi, yes, no, I get it. I mean, uh, she's trying to be closer to Aristotle there, but than either one. Um, Jim. Uh, <clears throat> I'm wondering about the motives of Heidegger. Uh, and I don't know if it's appropriate at this moment, but something along the lines of uh, Rosen accused Heidegger of psychoanalyzing. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna psychoanalyze Heidegger and say, is it possible that he tries to bootstrap off Nietzsche because he thinks that that's the end of Western metaphysics, the annihilism. So he has to find a way to adopt some Nietzschean ideas to give credence to his own uh, rewriting of the metaphysical history. I, I'm still trying to figure out what was driving Heidegger because I'm not convinced I feel like Plato, and I'm saying feel because I can't articulate this properly, was, was more pure in his intentions because he didn't have the history of Western metaphysics uh, behind him, whereas Heidegger does. And I think there's like a historical aspect of Heidegger's thinking is his own Achilles heel because he winds up being a slave to it in a way. He can't, he can't remove himself from the history to be able to look at it you know what I mean? So I'm, I'm still o only partly, but I mean, in the direction of the sort of the connection to Nietzsche, I think you have something there, but which is that he does think that the what is to be thought next, what is to be thought now, that is going to actually be connected to the history of Western philosophy, and and is going to sort of um, it has to be connected to that to have any chance of uh, of organically changing anything that comes after it, right? Has to deal with Nietzschean nihilism. Um, and that he, he, he's treating that as the um, proper isn't even the right, the right word, as the historically effective operative conclusion of Western philosophy, where Western philosophy has come out, right? So it's easy to go back to all the previous turnings and say, oh, but we, we hadn't made this turn, we wouldn't be here. Okay, fine, so what, we did, right? And here we are. So the, 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 the part where you're right that he has to bootstrap off Nietzsche is he has to connect to and react to that where it came out. Okay. Um, does that mean that he has to accept all of Nietzsche's uh, diagnoses of all the preceding stages of Western metaphysics? No, he can revise them. And in and, and, and very, very important places he does, but it is fundamentally Nietzsche he is contending with, reacting to, um, overcoming, what are his motives in doing that? I mean, lots of them, but one of them is he thinks that um, something like this direct experience of truth has been closed off by the view that you only ever contact your creations. You only ever contact the things that you make, right? If you live in the world of, uh, of if you live in a world of artificial productions, you don't have contact with anything outside the cave. Right? <laughs> so, so there he's, he's agreeing with uh, Plato's reorientation point, fundamental reorientation point in the whole allegory that mm. philosophy wants to actually make contact with truth. 
and not just with, with constructions, mm -hmm. right? Um, where does he see that happening in his own stuff? He sees that happening in his own stuff in the understanding of the place or site where all of this philosophical development has been happening, right? The, the, mm. the historical action of uh, Western thought occurring, uh, of the thinkers thinking it and driving it along, right? That the, the destinying of that history is the thing that he's thinking about as the, the it's not just as the, as the place where we have uh, contact with truth, it is, mm. but it's also um, that form of action is where contact with truth occurs. Okay, so that means that he's not expecting uh, uh, contact with truth as easily as a Platonist, right? But he is expecting it. So in that way, he's, that's a disagreement with Nietzsche, right? He's not a Nietzschean, everything is production. He's reacting against the everything is production view of truth. There's something which isn't production, which is the place or site where truth appears. Does that help? Yeah, which which Plato messed up by turning it into. <laughs> so I'm going to take you back before, when Plato so, first so, realized and, there was and, and maybe, concealment. <laughs> yes, and, and maybe maybe Plato messed that up according to Heidegger, but maybe also uh, Plato has his own version of that same fact, and this allegory is a bunch of it, right? In, in Plato, it's often the case that the deepest part of the dialogue is the myth, not the argumentation. Um, it's also where he's most poet. Um, but we'll, we're gonna get a chance to see Heidegger's direct read of uh, at least one of them, uh, of, of the cave allegory of what he sees in it in our next session. Our next, the next book is gonna be about that. Um, but uh, I think it is fair to say that uh, Heidegger, Heidegger has, his view of philosophy is definitely informed by Nietzsche, but Nietzsche is also the person he is trying to overcome. Hmm. Um, he can't escape getting in the ring with Nietzsche. <laughs> he's on, the, he's on the, the undercard with Nietzsche before he faces Plato. Right? <laughs> Uh, that's why Brotherman is the third man. So, is there a question? No, that was it. I just I was wondering. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, question. Yes, question, Carlos. Maybe out of place, but <clears throat> will we have you before or will we ever do Nietzsche? Uh, we did Heidegger on Nietzsche, but yes, we could do Nietzsche direct. We have done some things on it before. Um, uh, just a question. Don't mean to be pushing anything. No, it's a it's it's a fair question, and, and uh, reactions from others would also be useful uh, yeah. about whether or not other people want that or interested in it, or if they've already gotten it um, from Take others. Take it up later. Okay. Yeah. No, it's fair. Um, you know, one of the ones that uh, that I'm that I've got that I want to try to dig into is Walter Kaufman's book yeah. that deals with Nietzsche and Nietzsche and uh, and uh, Heidegger because he's very pro Nietzsche and very anti Heidegger. Isn't he the, the foremost translator for Nietzsche? Yep. I have, I have to tell you this joke because it was like one of the cruelest jokes we had in, in, in my uh, undergraduate days when we were all- Bring it this. on. Okay, so, so the, um, it's just three pieces of graffiti, right? God is dead, Nietzsche. Nietzsche is dead, God. And then Nietzsche, but the Z is missing. So Nietzsche is spelled wrong, Kaufman. <laughs> <laughs> Twisted mind. <laughs> what was your undergraduate? He, he's, he, he, he's going to interject himself into the conversation between Nietzsche and God to pedantically point out a small detail that is off, and he's going to be wrong about his the, the thing he's pointing out. <laughs> right. But 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 he but he's in the very important conversation. <laughs> All that matters. Anyway, that's the, that. That was the. Uh, this is unfair to Kaufman, but that's that's the reaction we all had to him as undergraduates when we were like twenty years old and uh, full of vinegar, because um, he was always interrupting our attempt to deal with this difficult problem with some 
footnote at the bottom of the page telling us about some <laughs> obscure German word that had nothing to do with what we were talking about and throwing his own interpretation in before he got to the end of the paragraph. Anyway, <laughs> just annoying. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to say something uh, about why I think um, Nietzsche is important here. Uh, and it, it's because of... Um, so it relates back to Plato saying that ultimately things come from the good, from the agathon. And uh, as we interpret it today, we interpret the good as some kind of value system. And this is, according to Heidegger, this is something we get from Nietzsche. That back in Greek days when... Um, uh, Plato was saying uh, everything comes from the eternal good. He wasn't meaning some moral value system sense of good. He, he was just, he, uh, uh, Plato meant it, it was the capable, the what worked. Whereas Nietzsche turned everything into a value system and therefore, the good uh, becomes, uh, do you agree with that this is good or is it bad uh, in the sense of morally good? And so now we go back and look at Plato through Nietzsche's eyes. And we're saying, oh, Plato's saying uh, it comes from the sense of the good. But what does good mean? That's just an, something else standing in for God. Or this is metaphysics, that there's something eternal that then decides what the forms are, which decides reality. And ultimately, uh, there's the sense of the immortal good that starts metaphysics and then in the end at the end of metaphysics Nietzsche just reduces the good to a value system and whether you agree with it or not and that's the nihilism the you know Heidegger's trying to react against. I'm going to agree with almost all of that but a couple points right first of all the fact that the good meant the capable to Plato is really just amounts to saying Nietzsche said, oh, Plato figured out what the good is. The good is power, right? That's why he talks about the will to power and why he uses the term power. It's his substitute for the capable. Um, but what's actually going on in Plato may be a little subtler than that because yes, it is the capable, but it's also the capable that you would actually choose, right? The formulas for the good in Plato are things like what the wise would choose, right? And they're formal. The content is not filled out, right? It's not meant to be a prescription. It is meant to be a formal description of, uh, it has to be what the, what the wise would choose, right? So there is a capable in it, but there's also just this ordering system, not necessarily value system, but ordering system of all the other arts require something else to prescribe their, uh, uh, their time and mode of action and purpose to them. One art does not, the architectonic art, right? The architectonic art decides what all the other arts are for. You get this also in, in Aristotle, right? Um, and that architectonic art decides what the right life is. And Plato has decided what the right life is. It's the philosophical life, right? So the philosophical life is also, is also the good, right? It's not just the capable. It's also something like the philosophical life. I also want to point out that it's not just later with uh, uh, Nietzsche at the very end of metaphysics, that the platonic good gets reinterpreted as a god that produces the forms. That's already there in Philo. It's there in the, it's in the Neoplatonists. So 
people reacting to Plato within a few hundred years of his own time already made that segue, that connection, right? And uh, Nietzsche is well aware of that fact and he's pointing, pointing back to it. He's not just inventing it later as part of his own value philosophy. So most of what you said, absolutely right. The fact that it uh, doesn't mean primarily moral, it means primarily capable, absolutely right. This is stuff you get in the Philebus in particular where he distinguishes between the good and the pleasant. The good is not the pleasant, right? The good has to have this notion of capable efficacy, pragmatic power, success, whatever uh, attached to it. But it's also the architectonic and the, the, the thing which is deciding the ends for everything else, which is, closer to, which is closer to value hierarchy than, uh, than you might think. Yeah, the, the, the notion that ultimately it's what decides things, that's what Heidegger calls metaphysics. Mm -hmm. And he's reacting against. Yes, but he, I think he's prim yeah. I think I think he's primarily reacting against the the uh, the way in which Nietzsche, by turning it into a value system which is purely voluntary and is subordinate to the will of the person responding to it, it has actually been closed off from any contact with the reality outside the will. The person is now only living in wills, somebody else's or his own. There is no outside wills. So it's that lack of grounding, that lack of contact with, uh, with a truth or an external reality that, he, that Heidegger sees in Nietzsche that I think upsets him or uh, that he is reacting to, that he treats as the actual origin of nihilism, that closing off the you know, formula of nothing is happening to being, right? That closing off is, is what uh, Heidegger diagnoses as the actual nihilism at the root of the nihilism that Nietzsche diagnoses. Is that fair? Yeah. Uh, I, uh... Yeah, I'll, I'll go along with everything you said. Yeah. All right. Uh, sorry, Jim, was there a question? Rebecca was trying to be funny. She said she wants you to say the uh, the arc of tectonic art five times quickly. <laughs> <laughs> About one time slowly. <laughs> I want to I want to give people a chance to ask questions. We've got we've gone through a, a lot of it, and I'm, I'm sure people will have, have others. Um, but uh, I don't want to drag it too long because we've managed to get into a, a fair number of things. Um, but questions, parts that you actually wanted gone over, didn't understand, or Craig, one sentence that I that I couldn't put into uh, a better better understanding is page ninety four. Uh, okay. Last last sentence of uh, first paragraph. Far from furnishing this compulsion, nature must herself be compelled by what might be called militant pharmacological psychiatry. <laughs> Great line. Yeah. So you, yeah. you you weren't able we weren't able to understand what that means, or I was trying it, to figure out what, what he was trying to say by it. Um, takes a few pills. Take well, the red pill. <laughs> um, uh, two, two, two things. Uh, for, first, there's this whole elaborate thing in Plato's Republic where in order to figure out who the next generation of uh, philosopher guardians are going to be, you have to do this uh, elaborate mating selection procedure to you know, uh, pair up the right people. And you have to tell them all of these uh, tall stories about why they have to do it then and not at some other time. And there's a, uh, uh, there's a bunch of mumbo jumbo about a particular mating number uh, being used in all this. Um, and uh, so th there's, there's um, mystological, uh, mysti mystifying, deliberately obscurantist manipulation used to program the, uh, the, the mating of the next generation. In, in, in the Republic. The other 
point though is that he he rosen is pointing out the similarities of that version of utopia with the modern ones with the brave new worlds right the 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 the, the, the mustafa man world controllers are updated philosopher kings right and in the modern world they would uh, uh, control people with soma rather than uh, rather than stories about uh, mating numbers um but but it, but it's the same kind of 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 aggressive manipulation of nature nature has to be twisted by by a scientific intervention one way or the other uh for for the for the political construction dream to work in the in the actual republic that's this made up stuff about eugenics in the modern updated you know brave new world version it's uh it's uh more it's you know pharmacological psychiatry <laughs> right um but he that's what rosen is uh, is alluding to there does that help carlos greg you done uh on page 88 Second paragraph, uh, second sentence, since there is no predication in essence, our attention is gradually shifted to the continuing and measuring oh, of properties. The counting and measuring of properties. Yes, what did I say? Continuing. I can't read. It's counting fine. and measuring, which, which I understand. Who does the shifting? The environment in which we live? Um, He's talking about the uh, uh, the sequence. This is the sequence of uh, taking us from seeing to talking, or taking us from the noetic intuition to um, syntax uh, in positivism, right? So he, when he he's saying that this shift happens over the course of the history of philosophy, okay. from the time of Plato and Aristotle to the time of the logical positivists. So the people doing the shifting are succeeding generations of philosophers getting more and more concerned with their logical machinery and less and less concerned with directly viewing the event of being or something like that. It, 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 it is not a concerted effort by anyone. It's just the resulting of the resulting, well, the result of philosophizing. It, there's, there's, it is a, it is an effort for some, right? Um, especially it's the nominalists, but it's also a, a tendency, how to put it? There's an incentive or tendency in that direction built into the fact that all the purely noetic stuff is silent and depends upon the, the reader bringing his own experience and machinery to, to, to the table. Whereas all the stuff, which is the, you know, just talking about it and counting and measuring properties, you can actually write down on the page and do for him. So, so if a philosopher comes later and does more of it for the uh, uh, for, for the reader than the previous generation of philosophers, right? He he gets more purchase with those who want it all on the page and don't want to do the work of seeing it themselves. So eventually they just crowd out the people who uh, uh, who say there's anything to see on the page and they will think for you mechanically. That makes them sound like politicians. It's it's more about a technical dominance in a in a rhetorical race, if if that makes sense. So there's the connection to, to politicians. It's just there's a kind of rhetorical dominance to spelling it out more for people, compared to leaving more of it as an exercise for the reader. The more you leave as an exercise for the reader, the less likely you are to buy your textbook. Correct. You got to think. Right. Fine question. Thanks. Thanks. Jim, questions? Don't tell me you don't have something underlined. <laughs> What's that? Don't tell me you don't have something underlined. <laughs> well, I, I, a lot of the stuff you were addressing, I, um, sure. I wanted to go. Well, Greg stole my a question on page ninety four. The same. Um, sure. He didn't steal it. He 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 was. got to it got first. To, I got it. Yeah. yeah, that also jumped out of the page at me. I guess I'm still um, the way it ends because I know we covered it briefly, but sure. Um, so what I see in the end is him kind of retreating to Kant. Yeah. So why is he really? Bring, yeah, similarly what? between Plato and Kant, not to mention Aristotle on the central question of metaphysical production, similarly in the course of non-identity. 
So then I started going down a, a hole of uh, the law of identity. You know, I, I have a hard time understanding when I'm supposed to, you know, like in the beginning, I was trying to ponder substance dualism because of the, the use of substance and properties and what that means to me. Then at the end here, same thing, I was like, okay, am I, am I supposed to get into a big thing about the law of identity? And does the law of identity extend out? You know, but I, I, that's probably a rabbit hole. I think the hardest I, thing- I, I think it is. I mean, the, 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 what I'm seeing in the last <laughs> page is he, he's, um, He's looking for positions that are uh, not subject to the criticism Heidegger had made of Plato. In the course of the of the whole uh, chapter, he's kind of uh, given up certain uh, notions about uh, the re reality of external forms that are common in Platonism uh, in response to those criticisms, um, while trying to preserve the notion that there is something merely discovered, not made about the most important truths that ideas are trying to be about, right? And part of his strategy for doing that is to accept Kantian versions of some of those things rather than Platonic versions of some of those things. Yeah. So what he's, that, that means that if, he, if he's backed off full-fledged uh, Platonic realism of the ideas to a more Kantian position of, um, uh, they're how we have to think about things, something like that. Um, then he wants to know, is, is that position I'm retreating to uh, already taken in flank by Heidegger's criticism, right? Am I gonna be able to hold this position or is he just gonna destroy me with the same argument that ran over my Plato position, right? So that's fundamentally what he's assessing on the last page is whether or not Heidegger's criticisms of Plato also extend to Kant on this subject. And he's basically acknowledging that they do, but he's still going to stick at that Kantian position. The fact that Heidegger's arguments apply to Kant as well as to Plato is not enough to move Rosen off that point, right? Um, so, uh, in other this this is uh, on 131. The key sentence is: In other words, Kant accepts the, Plat the Platonist Aristotelian thesis that to be is to be something definite and of such and such a kind. That's the core thing that Rosen is not willing to give up that he wants to preserve from Platonism, right? He does. He thinks if you give that up, you, you'll end in Nietzscheanism and, sub, and, and non-made non external realities will dissolve, right? Okay. So that's the point he's not willing to give up. He says, in neither case does one find any mention of being that is not this or that, and it is such and such a kind. The closest one comes to this is the idea of the idea of the good, etc. For Kant, being is not a real predicate, etc. But the, the all all of that is he's trying to say, on a Kantian basis, a Kantian understanding of ideas, I can preserve that to be is to be something definite of such and such a kind, and that's where I'm going to stand. That's a, that's fundamentally what that last page is doing. Um, so he says, Heidegger's central obsession with the covering over of being by beings is applicable to Kant as is to Plato. So if, if, if Heidegger's problem is that by seeing um, uh, to be is to be a being, kind, separate, uh, not being capital, tout core, right? If, if that's covering over being, uh, Rosen is going to uh, continue covering over being. He's going to stay with Plato and Aristotle and Kant in covering over being by beings, right? And the fact that Heidegger sees there as being something which is closing off original truth in that is not going to move him. That's okay. the, to me, the read of the last page. All right. Does that um, help? Yes. The other question I had was, you know, he starts off by saying, okay, here's, Here's to, to rescue Platonism. I'm going to, I'm going to offer modifications to Platonism yes. that I think will, will help it survive. Yes. I'm asking your opinion. Do you think that he he's justified and or accurate in doing that? And could you sort of um, compare and contrast original or let's yep, say orthodox? 
I got with it. What so, you're proposing. So, so, so uh, there's two versions of this. There's the, the fundamental one, which is the ideas. It's the fundamental philosophical one. There's also the political one. The political one happened in chapter five, where he, uh, he basically uh, retreated from the madness of platonic politics to the sobriety of Aristotelian politics, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there, you know, he's, he's in perfectly sound ground in doing that, right? Uh, and the contrast is real, right? So that's the easy part. The hard part is in, in six, he's also trying to uh, retreat from the uh, full platonic understanding of external ideas. And he has all of his own reasons for doing so, having to do with this, uh, are things copies or not? And, uh, and, and what, what's a noetic copy in the first place and original and image and all that stuff. I don't think he does a terribly good job there, right? I know why he uh, wants to go that direction, but I don't think he, I don't think that his substitute Platonism is more, uh, is sounder than the original. Um, is it immune to the criticisms of, uh, the productionist crit criticisms of a Nietzsche, let alone a Heidegger? I don't think it's particularly more um, defensible against them. Um, I don't think it's that position is all that um, destroyable by them in the first place. So I don't think the retreat is necessary, is what I'm, is what I'm saying. Okay. Um, but uh, I see why he's doing it and he has his whole elaborate theory of it. Um, I think that his reasons for liking that elaborate theory have a lot to do with the fact that he came up with it and the fact that it also answers a bunch of Hegelian objections rather than Nietzschean objections, entirely different story. That's just inside baseball about Rosen himself. Okay. But uh, uh, there's still something here, which is that um, he is uncomfortable simply accepting the original platonic understanding of ideas as Plato intended them because of, the, in part because of the welter of criticism all the way from uh, Aristotle to Heidegger um, thrown at their uh, seeming artificiality and uh, unbelievability, something like that. Um, they haven't gotten any more uh, credible or uh, harder to believe since uh, Plato wrote the Parmenides and came up with the best objections to them, in my opinion. The best objections to the ideas of the third red argument that Plato himself presented in the Parmenides out of the mouth of Parmenides. And the, the other arguments people have come up with against the ideas since are um, no better than that one, so to speak. Do you, do you um, agree that he, like he says they're circular and only philosophers could agree because it's circular. Do you think he's right about that? The, the platonic hypothesis that of the ideas is no more than a hypothesis and it's an attempt to explain how something like uh, uh, real truth, eternal truth can happen and can happen as something thought by uh, a finite and historical uh, mind. And that's always going to be a difficult, uh, a difficult concept. Um, the reason why he thinks you need a theory of that is because he thinks that it actually happens. And most of the other people objecting to it don't have a better theory of that happening. Their theory is that it doesn't happen. I see. But to me, I, I, the thing that I think Rosen is fairest about, this was actually earlier, is when he said, Platonism is a problem, not a doctrine, right? The, 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 the hypothesis of the ideas is an attempt to explain how truth happens. And if it doesn't happen that way, it either doesn't happen or it happens some other way that other people have not yet explained. I'm not partial to the view that it doesn't happen. I'm perfectly yeah. willing to hear a better, a, a, a better explanation of how it does happen. I don't think the other explanations of how it does happen that have come along are better. Okay. That's my own judgment. Okay, so I have another question that popped in my head because you said that, but I don't, I'll just say it. Is that like, um, so suffering is an, this is an existential idea, right? Suffering is unescapable, inescapable in life. We, we realize this, but uh, suffering produces, well, it can produce nihilism or it can produce, I guess you'd say the most laudable 
Uh, I, I understand where you're going, but it's you know? too far. It's too far afield from the truth question for me to map it directly. Okay. It's, okay. it's it's just the analogy is too loose, and and this is the kind of thing where you have to be exactly on the real problem. All right. And and guidelines from a, a, a similar similarity relationship, I I don't think are necessarily going to help. I mean, we could go through it if we have more time, but. Uh, yeah. The person who I think came closest probably was Aristotle. Um, and he had an entirely different way of trying to do it, but it's often de anima, by the way. But if you go to the crucial step where he has to give the final you know, piece of how he's gonna explain how this happens, he relapses to a little tiny passage of Platonism and gives up. This we, this famously upset a lot of the commentators because it, 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 we were trying to, you know, make them consistent with one another um, and led to all kinds of weird thought in the Islamic Middle Ages in particular, but that's an aside. Um, okay, thank you. Okay, um, and to be clear, when I, we're, we're, it's not like there aren't philosophers who have other um, views of some of these things later the, of the don't, doesn't happen variety or, uh, other kinds of truth variety, like in Heidegger, other kinds of truth happen. Um, and he has perfectly good under, uh, explanations of those. He's still not talking about exactly Plato's problem, right? Which is, you know, uh, eternal truth appearing to a finite mind about a particular, a noetic particular. It's not a general, um, and it isn't a construction. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Anyway, I, I think that's the reason why uh, platonic realism is a hardy perennial in math, say, right? It's precisely because it, it, does, it does seem to be uh, an attempt at, at, at an answer to that kind of question. And the mathematicians who are platonic realists care about that because it thinks they think it's what they actually do for, their, for a living. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, other questions? Yeah, so not, just, oh, sorry, go, Pete. I, like, uh, just a comment on, uh, so the Plato uh, comes up with this concept of truth that's based on, let's say, correspondence with the forms uh, and it's eternal. And therefore that starts metaphysics and we end up with Kant, but I think Heidegger in a way is uh, really close to Plato because it's Plato's idea that the truth is hidden and needs to be revealed in the cave. And that's he Heidegger's idea that truth is the unveiling, is the unhiding. And that's there in the myth of the cave. And then Plato goes on to elaborate it and he comes up with the eternal good it is behind it. But it, it's a sign that, you know, you know, Heidegger's saying, well, the, the Greeks had access to the truth and then Plato kind of covered it over with metaphysics. Yeah, he did that, but Plato was also really close to the uh, Heidegger's notion of the truth as unhiding or discovering so, the truth. I, I mostly agree with you. I mean, one thing that realized though is that the, the, the unhiding notion, uh, it, yes, it's there in the allegory of the cave, Yes, it's there in Heidegger. It's also there in Heraclitus, right? It, it's it's there in, in people before the Socratics uh, at all, right? It's there in the word as well, right? And and it probably reflects some you know our, our archaic mythical level uh, 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 Greek thinking as well as a result. But um, it's not the point of uniqueness to see that, right? So it's um, and it's not it's also not Plato's. Uh, it's not Plato's particular doctrine. It's not Plato's particular uh, problem. Plato's particular problem is not that there isn't. It's not that there is a, 
an event of unhiding, right? That that uh, you know nature loves to hide, and Heraclitus was already there, right? The the the, the difference is that Plato has a vision of what the the truth experienced afterwards is like, and in that vision, uh, in that vision, which is the you know the the upstairs, the outside of the cave part, right? Um, there is a there is even room for a very Heideggerian structure of this thing, which is the uh, the beyond being upon which being is understood. It's just that thing isn't time. It's the idea of the good, and that's why they're close. The actual structure is close, but they have two very different orientations of the axes of where they think that beyond being is. And uh, Rosen jokes in passing that the way up is not the way the same uh, way with the same down. He assimilates uh, uh, Heidegger to Herac uh, Heraclitus, who's famous for saying the way up is the same as the way down. But uh, that's almost an aside. But the fact that time is the axis upon which uh, um, Heidegger sees uh, being as being projected is in a way back to Heraclitus, right? So uh, I don't think Heraclitus had anything like Heidegger's notion of time, but he, he did see being on the, on the background of becoming, right? Um, so, the, and the, the, the thing which Nietzsche objected to most in Plato is precisely the oriented away from becoming and toward the eternal. And so that the fact that the idea of the good pointed toward eternal instead of toward becoming was the thing which distinguished for Nietzsche Plato in a way that, that Nietzsche thought was a, falsi a falsifying and a, and a departing from truth, right? Yeah, and I, I think that, that that is the difference between Plato and Nietzsche. Uh, and it, it, you know, it's there in Plato uh, but I guess my remark is that from the perspective of today, that the logical positivists don't need Plato. They don't need sure. the myth of the cave. Sure. Uh, but the myth of the cave is really close to Heidegger's point about truth being undiscovering. I agree with you. Rather than correlating with. I agree with you. I, I would say I would say that it's it's a it's a core, it's a core thing of philosophy, and it's a core understanding of philosophy as a kind of reorientation. Um, uh, but, but yes, I I think that uh, I mean that's going to come out when we get to the early part of uh, uh, the next book, right? Because you know that's uh, when when Heidegger is in that pass going through the uh, the allegory of the cave, he will he will see that similarity. So to speak, um, but yes, I think I think that on that sort of, if I can put it this way, core philosophical point, they're philosophers, right? Um, and they share that. They're not, they're they're not uh, opponents on, on on a point like that. Okay, um, Craig. One last uh, kind of question, which uh, hopefully isn't too much of a diversion. The next to the last paragraph of this lecture, uh, 109, the top of the page, um, I couldn't figure out where he was going with that, whether he was just looking at a way to try to end his lecture or what. Uh, the It's a long story. Uh, oh, yes, he's talking about the... Uh, the political political revolution, right, under flag, under flag of Plato rather than Aristotle. Um, uh, so you're you're wondering why it's a long story, or you want to know the story, or what? Uh, a little bit of both, or why why he even put that paragraph in there? Is he... So um, the 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 book. Of his that would become closest to this is the uh, the book called the uh, the quarrel between the ancients and the moderns, right? Um, but there's a there's a whole um, just as uh, Heidegger has a, a a standard view of the history of Western metaphysics and you know its various stages, um, 
the Straussian tradition he is in has such a view of the history of political thought in Western thought, right? Um, where you have, you know, the ancients, Plato and Aristotle with a certain understanding of relationship, relationship between philosophy and politics. And then you had moderns like Machiavelli who initiated modern politics um, in part by um, being willing to be more radically interventionist in, uh, uh, in philosophers be more willing to be radically interventionist in human affairs, something like that. And that's part of the turn from the Middle Ages to the modern world is the fact that the philosophers stop being quietists about politics and start being interventionists and even revolutionaries about politics. And that includes the tradition of people like um, Machiavelli and Hobbes and Locke and Rousseau and, and, and that whole line. And the point that Rosen is making there is that um, uh, it is useful to trace through those people where, how, mu how much they're influenced by Plato versus how much they're influenced by Aristotle. His own claim is that a lot of that revolutionary stuff was already there in Plato. It's not just there in the moderns. And in his book, um, The Quarrel Between Ancients and Moderns, he, you know, challenges the, 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 the view that, this, that the revolutionary tendency is a purely a modern tendency by saying, actually, um, uh, the, the non-revolutionary tendency is an Aristotelian te uh, tendency across all of these things, and the revolutionary tendency is a platonic one. Um, so I think that's what he's fundamentally uh, alluding to there. And to most people who don't know anything about those things, that's like an intermural, an intermural a fight between different camps of Straussians or something, but it's uh, he's not agreeing that it that revolutionary politics only comes with Machiavelli in the modern age. He's saying revolutionary politics is there in Plato. Okay. Does that help? Yeah. Did we do ancients and moderns? I think we did some of it. We I, I know we did a couple of chapters from it. Uh, we may have done the whole thing, but we we yeah. did do it once when we were still meeting in person. Um, I, I especially remember uh, discussing. Uh, some of the later chapters about uh, Nietzsche from that book, but I don't know if we did all the early chapters. Yeah. Well, the other the other thing, the the clue that you triggered for me was reminding me that he comes that uh, Rosen comes out of the Strauss camp. He that, does. He's he's unusual yeah. among the Straussians in that he's kind of a uh, uh, equally influenced by Kojev, um, and he uh, winds up thus on a kind of center left position. But he's he's uh, definitely trained by all the Straussians and all their political stuff. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. The, the only other struggle I had, you know, sometimes trying to tie that back in is some, some of the, some of the things he says about uh, Plato and the, and the, and the Republic uh, sound almost overly authoritarian. And I didn't think that that was where he was coming from. He's not an authoritarian, but he's highlighting the fact that there's a lot of really authoritarian stuff in the Republic in part because he his own politics are more Aristotelian than Platonic, and, and, and in part to, uh, to um, disabuse people of the notion that Plato is simply a conservative in some sense, because he's yeah. also a revolutionary. Yeah, he made that comment in one other point too. As well, I was on page 108. I also yeah. Figured, yeah, I actually got more out of chapter five than I told you at the beginning. <laughs> so. Okay, okay, fair enough, fair enough. No, all good questions. All right, if there's no further questions, we're gonna meet on the uh, 26th, uh, one and first 75 pages of this, where we'll get, um, you'll get first a little preliminary intro thing and then a capsule distinction between the um, truth as correspondence versus uh, truth as original unveiling and then straight into the allegory of the cave and it's four stages. He's, uh, the balance of part one is kind of his summation of lessons from it, but the part that we'll be reading will go through all four stages of the allegory of the cave, Heidegger's own um, exposition of it. All right, Carlos, question. Uh, this next this next uh, reading assignment is, uh, that book will cover what the next uh, meeting and the one after that or just one? Uh, well, we're gonna get through the, uh, the part on the allegory of the cave in one meeting, we will, I would expect to do another meeting after that on the balance of part one, that would be parts two, and uh, sorry, uh, part one's sections two and three, the idea of the good and unhiddenness and um, 
the question concerning the essence of untruth. Part two is an interpretation of the, of the Theotetus, whole dialogue. <clears throat> and I don't know that we're gonna do that uh, right away. We might wanna read the Theotetus first, um, but uh, I, I'm also open to people's inputs, but I ex expect to do two sessions on, on the part one of this book, one through 75 and the, and the second session on the, on the balance of, of part one. And then either we'll go straight on to the Theotetus part or we might just go read the Theotetus first. Um, but I'll, I'm interested in people's input on that. So I'll go with that. Okay, good question. Yeah, All right. that's, that, yeah that's good. Uh, I'm in favor of uh, your plan to go to the Theotetus first and then to go to the part about Heidegger's commentary on it. All right, sounds good to me. That will be a fun, uh, a fun set of things. All right. Um, so thanks everyone and uh, I'll stop recording and see you guys next time.